The Board of Trustees of Christos Independent School District will meet in regular session at 6 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. Uh, Monday, December 13, 2001, in the Administration Building Boardroom, 613 West Ohio Street, Bristol City, Texas, 78839. Uh, at this point, I mean, uh, we'll call the meeting to order. Time is 6.06. So six, okay. Number two, uh, roll call and establish a little quorum. Mr. Eric Garcia, absent. Mr. A. Spinoza. Present. Mr. Kuzmata. Present. Mr. Victor Bonilla III. Present. Mrs. Mora Flores Guerrero. Present. Mrs. Melissa Marquez Guerrero is absent, and Mrs. Peggy Young is absent. For the record, we do have a quorum. Number three, uh, moment of reflection. Number four, uh, audience to patrons. No Number five, uh, special recognitions, uh, Ms. Jones. So at this point, we would like to recognize both the Campus Teacher of the Month and Student of the Month by Campus, starting with uh, Dr. Tomas Rivera. meets her, she has the biggest heart ever. She is always willing to try her best and help others, has a positive attitude all of the time. Um, she's just a joy to on campus. So yes, I saw her.
Oh, we're on this week now? <laughs> Everything ran smoothly. 
didn't have to worry about it, so that took a lot of my time. So, um, teacher of the month. Yes, yeah, my best student. Uh, every time I see her, puts a smile on my face, a uh, great student. Um, she, uh, we were in class and I just started going down the hallway and opened the door and like, who's going to do GT? And she's like, I am. And I'm going to do uh, you I am, I am. Like, okay, all right, Leila. Then Leila competed in three events and she medaled in all three events. Good. And she got first place district in spelling. They say smile with their eyes from their mouth. What about one with the parents? Parents, parents. It's okay. Come on, Daddy, you too. Come on, Daddy, you. Come on, just all right. Come on.
Give him gold. Give him gold. Defensive tackle 
and academic of district. Brian Mendoza, honorable mention safety and of district academic. Eddie Martinez, honorable mention corner, all academic of district. Isaac Garcia, honorable mention offensive tackle and academic of district. And he's also a top band performer. Juan Sosa, second team of district fullback and academic of district. Juanas Stapia, second team all district wide receiver and academic all district. And we finally got Brandon Fittis, first team all district and academic all district. <laughs> the, football, the football season was, was a little rough, but this, uh, this is the most all district selection we have had. 28 academic of district, 30 selections. It's it's the highest we've ever had. I've been here 10 years, and that's the most academic of district we have gotten. So I'm very, very proud of them because I know they're gonna be okay when they leave our, our hallway. So I'm very, very proud of them. We're going to proceed with the agenda, uh, item number six, federation to approve the minutes for uh, November the uh, 2nd special, November the 8th regular, November the 11th special, and November the 29th uh, special, that they remain under consent. Mm -hmm. The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the consent action items as per the attached individual recommendations and the consent action. Can we have a motion uh, for the November 2nd, 8th, and 11th? Uh, because uh, I was absent on the 29th and I want to. Yeah. So we have a motion by, by uh, Nora Guerrero. I second. Second by Cruz Marta to approve the 8th, 11th, and uh, Second. And second. And uh, all in favor? Aye. Now we need a motion to approve the uh, November 29th special board meeting. What, what was the vote count, sir? It was four, four zero. Okay. I'll make a motion on the other one to the system. We have a motion. Uh, by Nora Guerrero to approve the 29th. Second. This is for what? For the uh, November 29th. And the reason, I mean, I put it separate because I think I was absent on that day. You know? Oh, okay. So what you mean? All right. Okay. All right. I uh, second. Okay. We have a, uh, a motion, a second. All in favor? Aye. Abstain. Abstain. Motion carries. Okay, now I uh, uh, consider the uh, to approve the monthly bills for November 2021. The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees. Uh, oops, excuse me.
The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the monthly bills for November 2021 under consent action. Do I have a motion to move? Motion one. We have a motion a second. All in favor? Motion carries 4-0. Thing number seven, we're going to action items. Uh, a, discussion and consideration to adopt and receive policy uh, statements according to the instructional sheet for test B, a policy update 118, affecting local policies on a second and final reading. Ms. Leones? That the Board of Trustees add, revise, or delete local policies as recommended by Task B Policy Service and according to the instruction sheet for TASB localized manual update 118, affecting local policies on second and final reading. So a motion. So move. Motion Sonia, second. Ignora Guerrero, in favor. Motion carries 4-0. We move to uh, which one is it? B. Okay, uh, action item B discussion and consideration to approve adding and authorize a uh, representative giving full power to ex execute the agreement and other documents as may be uh, required for the long start investment pool. The recommendation is that the Board of Tr Trustees approve adding myself, Dina Briones, as an authorized representative, giving full power to execute the agreement and other documents as may be required for Lone Star Investment Pool. And so the rationale here is that we need to change the personnel because the personnel that are currently approved are no longer with the district. Right. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. Motion second. Uh, uh, question, uh, you'll be the only one or we have? No, it's myself and Ms. Estrada. Ms. Estrada, mm -hmm. okay. It's okay, uh, so uh, all in favor? Okay, motion carry. C, discussion and consideration to approve an audit of district financials by ESC 20. Uh, this, is a, this is a request that was made by board member Young. The recommendation is that the board of trustees uh, consider conducting an audit of district financials by the ESC 20. And so I do have to just caution the board that as per the service center, uh, this is the request that was made. So I'm presenting the request as it was, it was made to me. Uh, it would be a conflict of interest for the service center to conduct an internal audit of the uh, CCISD because they are our accounting firm. Uh, in addition, uh, based on the last five years of our first rating reports, we just did the last one this, uh, earlier this uh, evening, there is no indication by our own external auditors that there is a need for a more in-depth uh, review of our, uh, of our financials. And so the recommendation, because it's a conflict of interest, is uh, if the Board of Trustees is considering a more in-depth audit of the district financials that we go with the third party, not the service center, because it would be a conflict of interest if that is your vote. And that's your recommendation? My recommendation at this point is that there is no need no. to conduct an internal, uh, a more in-depth internal investigation. Mr. President Spinoza, uh, I move that, uh, that uh, we do not approve an audit of, of district financial by ESC 20. And that's okay. basic, and that's basically. I mean, that's, that's what, that's what I'm yes. Second, okay. and that's basically what you recommend. Correct. Okay, so we have a motion, a second, uh, all in favor? Motion carries 4-0. Uh, D, uh, discussion considered to approve the purchase of a 1,900 uh, management license for Crohn's from CDWG. The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the purchase of 1,800 management license for Chromebooks. The Chromebooks are already arrived. It was a, an item that you all approved last month. They are here, but now we need the licenses. They exceed the purchasing authority, so we need your approval for the purchasing of licenses. Once we put motion, we have a second. Second. 
Like the mushroom, I thought once we approve them, uh, come on, will it be till we get on? Jesse, time frame. Time frame for the mm -hmm. license? Mm -hmm. But uh, it should be about a week or so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Could it also be that some of the other school districts Group? increase? Correct. And mm -hmm. that's why yes. we have this. Yes. Any more questions on the enrollment report? Now we go to a ADA report. It's the same, it's the same Mr. It's the same yes. thing. Yes. 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 New uh, banning forms. Mr. Posada? Mr. Posada has a presentation of a proposed uh, band uniform. Get here, oh, this is going to come before us later? Yes. This is just a presentation. Yeah, this is, I believe, only one bid. Can you work? Uh, this is Ankin, by the way. He's our model for today. Yeah. Um, this is our concept of uniform for the next year. Um, it's by Stanbury. Stanbury Uniform, they did our previous uniform, the last, uh, the white and green one. Uh, we're changing up the colors a bit with one with a black, uh, black pattern. The black gives us, is able to help us when it comes to hiding mistakes on the field, and it's also aesthetically more pleasing. I, we did maintain the school colors in the white, green, and gold, uh, because of course, Havelina colors have to be in there. The hat has the Havelina logo embroidered onto the hat. And this is, this would be, this would be our Friday look, the whole band that has this uniform on. It would, the right set position. So that's a little bit of a preview of what our Friday match would be right before we perform. Um, we did keep the gold sash to add a little more color into it. Uh, it is, what was that? It is sleeveless, it is sleeveless, and the material on the coat is lighter, so it is breathable, and the kids won't be cooking inside. So, and also what we need to is that you can zip it up from the front, front end of the coat, instead of them having to struggle, having to struggle with that kind of zip up. Um, the shirts, the band will be getting shirts, uh, UV shirts, the, we consider called the, the band shirts, and they can switch out in the middle of a show, take the coat off, and you have a new color on the field. You can have half the group in one color, have the, the, the uniform, it adds, um, more choices to go on. Uh, on Saturday, for competitions, we have we are adding what is called a shako rack. The shako rack goes around the, hat, the top of the, of the hat, and it adds more uh, general effect. And marching band being the pageantry it is today, this is what helps a lot of groups advance to the next level. And now that we're going into three, how you mentioned, Mr. Uh, right now, Crystal City, Hondo, and Rio Hondo are the top three schools that went down to 3A, and we are, in the band, we're projected to be at the top of our game, hopefully next year, within the next coming years until the reclassification is done. And this adds an entirely different look to the hat. Now when you add, when you add the plume on there, again, we have a new design. So the ring was tall and you might hit the roof. So. so that is how our uniform would be on Saturday. Now we can change the plume. There is a feather plume that will go on the side. Unfortunately, I did not put that on the back. Uh, that will go on the side, and that will also be part of the, of the uh, purchase. But that plume will be in a green and green and white color. So there we have the whole lot here. So this would be the uniform for next year um, of all as well. And I'm change it up now that we're going to a new classification. Present ourselves as a strong group. Uh, with the new uniform. Any questions? How old are, are our uniforms right now? 
eight to ten years old. One that we have right now. <laughs> yes. Do you got them? Is it one or two? Is it just one arm? Yes, I have two. The only that the company only sent me one. This is their new prototype. Before the gauntlets would go that way, look like Batman. But this is a new style that so many of the drum cores and the, the high left tie in it, San Antonio bands are using. It goes upwards. You would have one on one side and you would have the other on this side. It shows that the company did send me one as a, as a sample. So, yes, our previous uniform is. Uh, eight to ten years old. It's been a while. Um, unfortunately, they're not white anymore. And it's, it's, it's time to. to, to. Any other questions? Angel, your mom has a picture of you. She she couldn't make it if you text me if you wanted to see you. <laughs> It'll be some million like proposal or something. If I want to ask him if it's the final. I have a question, sir. Uh, you already have a proposal. Do you already have a proposal uh, to how many uniforms and? I have a uniform proposal for standard, throughout, and FKM. FJM just gave me a estimate. They were the only company that didn't give me a breakdown. Brook Hub didn't give me a breakdown. Stanford did give me a breakdown as well. But uh, the Brook Hub design wasn't as as cooperative as this one is. This one catches the eye right away. The design wasn't as um, appealing. And that's one of the things that the judges look at when, when you go to these contests is, can you catch my eye as I'm writing my as I'm writing my comments from the previous band? And they always look to the sides for the next band. So like you're ready to bring it to the board soon or yes. We have we already have the numbers. We we did have a fitting, so we can have an estimate and we are looking at uh, two hundred uniforms. We are projected to have a, around 150 to 180 members in the NJB. Again, all goes well with our recruitment. And now with the inclusion of fifth graders taking music, we're trying to take all those fifth graders and be like, hey, join Bandage. So, uh, if, and again, if all goes well, we should have around 150 to 180 in the next five years. So. Any questions? Looks good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, I have, I have a question. I'm, I'm sorry, it's a good presentation. It's a, just a general question. Just a comment. Uh, uh, it's directed at the superintendent. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have the also the athletic department come by and present the the proposals for the for uniforms? uniforms? I don't believe they have in the past. Okay, well, just something you might want to. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, we'll, we go down to informational discussion, item C, uh, mid-year student performance presentation by campuses. So Mr. Fernandez, if you can open the first slide, we're gonna start with uh, Tomas Rivera. And so what this is going to be, uh, I've asked the campuses to present their, um, their first semester work to you. Uh, we have conducted a cycle one evaluation of every campus all of the initiatives that we have listed at the district level and at the campus level, the progress that, we, that we've made toward meeting those goals, and the barriers that the campuses have identified in terms of the work. And so I have asked the principals, the assistant principals, and the instructional coaches to facilitate this uh, presentation to you. Some of the data pieces will be the same, especially the first couple of pages, because it speaks to the work of the district. So Mr. Francis, if you can go to the first uh, slide. Uh, so all of this work that the campuses will be presenting to you began in the summer during our summer leadership conference. We established the initiatives for the 21-22 school year beginning with leadership development. From the very beginning, we knew that that's, that was going to be our focus. Uh, provided refreshers on the, the uh, TPES or the principal evaluation system. We are working and will continue to work on improving our instructional design and we will co correlate that design very specifically to the teacher evaluation support system. 
We have worked on curriculum mapping and planning. We have trained around the gradual release of responsibility instructional model, which is our instructional framework. We will provide a revised um, training on January the 3rd for the campus leadership team. We have conducted observations and have provided constructive feedback to, every, to the different uh, leadership members. And of course, we have conducted our own data analysis, very specifically around academic growth measures. This is uh, an accountability year for us. We are coming out of COVID. Uh, and so we are looking very specifically at closing that learning gap that COVID-19 created. Our work is going to be structured around the Effective Schools Framework, which all the campuses are familiar with, and we provided just a brief explanation of this. Um, and so this is where all the campuses are going to begin on this slide so that we don't duplicate the presentations. Uh, and so the campuses will take it from you. Okay, uh, I'm Mrs. Smith. I'm the principal at Montero Country. And during our, our cycle one that we did work in, as Brianna said, during the uh, summer leadership retreat, the uh, 5.1 and 5.3 were considered district determined priorities. So those are the ones that we were given that we needed to focus on. And then as a campus, we chose uh, 3.1 as a way uh, as the other dynamic they wanted to be working on. So 5.1 has to do with lesson planning, the gradual release of the responsibility. 5.3 is data-driven instruction for early release Wednesdays and backwards by design. That's what we've incorporated into our, our uh, structure for we want to be working on making these a priority. And 3.1 is developing and representing the campus mission and vision statement. All right, for cycle one in the planning process, we did have to identify our barriers. Number one, hands down, was just getting back into the pre COVID group. Um, going back to the systems that we had in place pre COVID, like RTI Staffing Tuesdays, T Test, it's been waived for a few years, uh, making sure that we're our instructional bounds and our coaching cycles, and getting back into PLC and really vetting our tests, looking at factors by design and utilizing uh, a data dig tool that, honestly, we tweaked from the lovely Ms. Hoffman that she had developed. Um, all of our action steps through cycle one were made, uh, met, or at least some progress was achieved. All of our student data goals were achieved. Our goals as a campus was staff buy-in. They, they, they run with everything, um, including our uh, embodying our vision and mission statement. Our grows are releasing the learning, and that's teachers releasing the learning to students, allow them to be more independent, and admin team releasing the learning to teachers to allow them to be more independent. Our next step for cycle two is growth. We are focusing on student growth, campus growth, and teacher growth. So we're going to build, a, we built from hallways data displays, classroom displays, those are really lovely to look at. I want students and staff engaged with them. I want the kids to know that their arrow is going up. And for um, teacher growth, Ms. Smith and I have challenged ourselves. We're going to meet with every single one of our teachers and do a middle of the year team test goal setting conference as a progress check where they are on the goals and help them move any barriers and help them achieve their team test goals. And Ms. McNeil over here has got some goals as far as coaching cycles that focus on teacher growth. Thank you. So I'm going to speak to my cycle one timing um, structural coaching feedback. If you can go ahead and pull up my uh, schedule, this bottom one. This one. Maybe I went ahead and I started with barriers because after the retreat, I don't know about anybody else, but I felt information overload. Where to begin? It's okay if you can't pull it up. Yeah, no. I wanted to provide you guys with the visual of my schedule, but I can go ahead and, and uh, speak to it. On Mondays, every Monday during teacher conferences, I provide teacher support. I go into uh, their classrooms as they're planning to assist if they need help with either the gradual release of responsibility model, if they need any support in clarifying the teams, or any other type of, um, maybe some uh, teacher resources, 
So that's my Mondays during the conference times. On Tuesdays, I attend staffings that are led by uh, Ms. Guerrero. Each teacher has a schedule every three weeks where they come in and they speak to uh, CBAs reports and to ICE teacher reports. We talk about student progress or lack of. If there is lack of progress, we talk about what are the strategies the teachers have been implementing and what can we change so that we can show some student progress. On Wednesdays during PLCs and early release days, what we do is we vet upcoming CBAs and we disaggregate the data from previous CBAs. The teachers take a look at their DMAX scores of the quintiles. They report on the highest SEs and the lowest SEs. The highest SEs teachers, we discuss on uh, what were the strategies that helped their students. Um, those teachers with um, the, the lowest performing SEs, we talk about what the other teachers did and maybe they can start implementing in their classrooms. Um, Thursdays, we have lesson plan audits. Let me go back to Wednesdays. I'm sorry. On Tuesdays, while well, I'm attending staffings with Ms. Guerrero, Ms. Olvera is attending staffings with Ms. Smith, and they cover behavior and attendance. Let me go back to Thursdays. Uh, we have lesson plan audits where Ms. Guerrero is filling out the lesson plan audit form to make sure that all the essential elements are in the lesson plans. Um, I meet or try to meet with Ms. Guerrero once a week so we can have IC principal collaboration. On Fridays, I designate Fridays for CBA and DMAT keys where I go ahead and create the CBAs and the DMAT keys for each of the three grade levels for reading and math. Those CBAs are created off of the pre-kinder guidelines for pre-K three and four. And for kinder, we use Teach Resource for math and we use HMH, our English curriculum, and Teach Resource for reading. Um, the rest of the time, and I really wish you could have seen that, the schedule, but the rest of the time is where I put in instructional rounds and feedback. And I also do my coaching cycle instructional rounds. Every Monday from 8.15 to 9, I, prov I provide Kinder RTI support along with Ms. Gonzalez for 45 minutes. In the afternoon, I also provide RTI support from 2.30 to 3.15. And, and I don't know if you're able to, but you can click on these links and it'll take you to those. On my instructional rounds and feedback, there is a form that I fill out. Um, I go in and I fill out that instructional rounds data tool. Then I meet with the teachers and provide that feedback. Each um, chart the teachers has to sign so that way we can show proof that we did meet and we did discuss the instructional rounds with them. The GLOWS, teacher support, releasing the learning, and backwards by design progress. Um, my grows, I feel that I need to um, start focusing on ensuring that the teachers are providing RTI support based on the low performing SEs, utilizing resources to strengthen parental support. And I feel that my instructional round feedback sessions need to be um, in a timely manner. I, I would like to provide that a day after. Um, next steps, create checkpoints for those low performing SEs. Attempt to create a growth measure report utilizing MCLAS boy, boy, and boy data. And I'm going to start my second round of uh, coaching cycle. No question. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, that you provide RTI morning support and afternoon. Yes. What? Working actually with the students? Yes, sir. How yes. many in the morning? We have 10 in the morning and 10 in the afternoon. And um, alongside with Ms. Gonzalez, she provides math RTI support and I provide the reading. And it's for how and long? And we just rotate them. It's a 45 minute block. And morning and afternoon. Morning and afternoon. There's two different groups though.
I have a, one quick. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned strategies. Uh, what's working and what's not working? What is it that's working? Can you identify that? Yes, what's working is their small group instruction. Unfortunately, we do have some teachers that are still providing more whole group support where those teachers who are providing a small group support, we're having more progress in those classrooms. Where we have those students at a smaller group okay. instead of providing that whole group. That way the students can be more independent at like literacy stations or math stations because the teachers are only working with a small group of kids versus everybody doing the same thing at the same time. It's more conducive to the students. Thank you. Anybody else? The next few slides, um, which I think you have in your board packet, are from our big data. We disaggregated the pre-K-3 CBA data. This would be CBA 1, 2, and 3. Uh, this is the, what I did is I gave this is what our goal was for cycle 1. This is the percentage. This is the number of students. So this is the goals that we set for cycle 2. Then pre-K-4, they set up. What our goal was, what we did, what our next uh, cycle two goals. The goal was at the beginning? Yes. This is going to be the cycle one goal. And this is what we did. Wait. So now we're bumping it up for cycle two. So how come you, you went from 69 to 70 in for the second cycle? Because well, uh, we want to achieve more. I mean, it's a. But it's only, I mean. You want to go even higher than that? No, I mean, I'm asking, I mean, because. I think with Kinder. No. I mean, a lot to 69. Right. I think with Kinder, we were nervous because now we're reading. First semester is learning the alphabet and the sounds. Second semester is now you've got to be able to read sentences and blend and learn about vowel teams. And yeah, because I feel like when you're, if your goal is to go one more percent, it's like. Yeah, it's gonna, to know. I mean, you guys are doing it. Okay. I would just ask. It's a working document, so we can always address the goal. What? If I may, ma'am, I, I noticed you guys also have a present the ice station data um, graph. Uh, my question is, you guys were able to also use the uh, tier one, tier two, and tier three at that level? Yes, yes. We oh. can still identify. You just have to use multiple sources of data, but this is um, a very research-based program that basically when a child tests, they're compared to students across the nation to, in order to get, and they have the actual tiering guides. There used to be age levels associated with that, but they felt that was abuse, so they took the age levels away. But yes, we could, We already, on my RTI staffing reports, I have students tiered already. We just, you know, pre-K-3, almost everybody's in tier two because they always have room to grow. Pre-K-4, you can tell the tier threes are really struggling with understanding how to use that iPad. Uh, but kindergarten is flowing and going. The, our big thing with our students is we want their arrow to go up because they get the same chart as an individual student. And so they will talk about, did my arrow go up? It's all about growth. Do you have any, any type of monitoring or assessment for the, uh, for the uh, three-year-old students? Three-year-olds are recommended to start by station in January. January. Right? So the adventure begins next week. Next, 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 next month. Next month, yes. Uh, cycle two, we're thinking of the same dimensions. We kind of just talked about what our next steps were. Um, you know, it's, it's all about growth. We're going to continue to work. We're going to continue to analyze through the data. We're going to do a successful set. And so that's the action steps we set for cycle two. Questions? What was your, hold on. Yes, sir. What's your vision statement? You mentioned... The vision statement is mission. We, we will all play, learn, and grow together. Oh, okay, that's the one. It's for all stakeholders, yes. Mm -hmm. You mentioned small groups, which is very interesting. Um, is it, what would you need in order to improve that? Because I know we're behind, and you're pretty much, you're the foundation, because you're covering what, first, pre-K first, Pre-K-3, Pre-K-4, and Kinder. And if kindergarten students 
cannot identify and, and blend CBC, CBCB, and CBBC words by the time they go to the model of first grade as the biggest task, they have to go from a level D at reading all the way to a J. They have to jump six, so I need to get them to a D by the end of the day. So, would it be a good idea to provide some type of tutoring for those students who are struggling in small group sessions and uh, I guess after school during the weekend or just to get them where they need to be at or is it a little bit too much or? It, it depends on the child. So it's always an option for, for teachers to keep the students who are not, a lot of the kids are falling asleep by the time they go home. They're exhausted. So. What we built in was a tutoring block, that 45 minute block that Mr. Espinosa was asking, we built that within the school day. And we push in an IA with teacher. the teacher, and then Ms. McNeil and Ms. Gonzalez are pulling out kids. So the groups are very small to make sure 45 minutes every single day we are tutoring those kids. Right now, it's not a, in my opinion, I'll refer to you to a tutoring problem. It's a, I'm used to teaching it this way, where everybody's being taught at the same time, and I need to switch to let me prep my centers so that I can call small groups. So it, to me, it's more of a, a T-test booking issue than the supplies or materials for tutoring. Mm -hmm. And the shift is happening. I mean, there's, there's a lot of really focus shifts on the campus. Uh, I remember when I went to the, the conference, they were talking about maybe even offering summer school, making it year-round just to catch up. Are we still doing that, Ms. Brioche? Yes. Year yes. Round? yes, we're still going to have that. It's always a negotiation because what it's usually you don't tutor the pre-K and the kinder, but last year I was lucky and I will negotiate again this year to make sure that we don't have any academic learning loss for those kids. It won't be year round, but we will have two summer school sessions. So that would be awesome if my students would be included. Thank you, ma'am. Savala Elementary. And so as uh, Ms. Lopez is coming up, and this is just to create some clarity, cycle one. Uh, began for us in September, so it's September, October, November. So this is an evaluation of those three months. Cycle two is where we uh, we just we're just starting in December, so it'll be December, January, and February, and in March we'll come back again with similar report. Uh, and we, they all of the campuses had to go through an evaluative piece, which was new for them in terms of the entire team in through this lens of, of accountability. Um, and so we will continue doing this, however, helping the campuses develop as we go through all of these, uh, have, continuing these conversations. December wouldn't really count, because we're gonna be, well, well two right. weeks. So it's December, January, and February. So we skipped to slide four, and um, as mentioned, 5.1 and 5.3 were different initiatives and we focus on objective driven daily lesson plans with formative assessments and data driven instruction. Um, we decided as a team to focus on 4.1 curriculum and assessments aligned to teach with year long sequence. This is a link to kind of show you our campus planning tool, but it's not working right now. So, so the team uh, came up with, uh, with, with the objective. And at the time, mm -hmm. it was just missed. So we came up with the third one. These the planning tool. The planning tool. That one. Yeah. On so currently, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, man, for interrupting. Uh, so is first, second, and third. First, second, and third. Second, and third. So to address daily lesson plans, we ensured that we have a universal lesson plan template that included the graduate release of responsibility. And we had to rate ourselves as Ms. Um, as mentioned, and we rated ourselves as met, met, met expectations. We also mentioned that we want to do walkthroughs and um, we wanted to record them and collect data on DMACS and UT tests. And we rated ourselves as some progress there. 
So our barriers that we that we encountered in implementing 5.1 was that the, the barriers that we encountered was to provide support to new teachers that were unfamiliar with the template and the graduate release of responsibility. So we had to provide a lot of training and additional support. And so some of the, the goals that we had are goals and our goals is for the gradual release of responsibility. All teachers were trained district district wide, and that's something that the district provided. And we provided as a campus additional training through Region 20 on how to incorporate the gradual release of responsibility into the lesson plans. So lesson plan audits are conducted. We make sure that we conduct those lesson plan audits on Thursdays to ensure that gradual release of responsibility are on all all four phases. However, walkthroughs were minimal, so we have a plan in place for that. So our next steps for what is that plan? If you hold on, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so our next steps, our next steps is um, graduate the responsibility for collaborative learning and checking for understanding. You do it alone. We're, we want to ensure that they they refine those areas. And we want to make sure that we adhere to a walkthrough schedule for admin teams. So you mentioned what is your plan for, for to conduct more walkthroughs is we've created a schedule in 30 minute increments to ensure that we're hitting all. So Monday, Tuesday as a leadership team, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we ensure that we have, we have time in our schedule built in to walk into those classrooms. And we're very intentional about we even put the teacher in there and it's a 30 minute increment schedule. So come Monday, we start at 8 o'clock. From 8 to 8.30, we're going to go into this. 8.30 to 9, we're going to go into this teacher. So we have the teacher, the time, and where we're going to be almost every minute of the day in 30 minute increments. I have a question now. Yes, Does the district central office tell you how many walkers to do? I know at one time, I mean, it was required. You got to do so many and everybody was running around. Cool. No, they're yeah. not telling us, and it's been very doable now that we've created that. I schedule. think it's better, I mean, that way, I mean, because. And so we, we share the responsibility. I've been doing, conducting walkthroughs, and then Mr. Sarnal will be in the office, and then vice versa, to ensure that everything's good. I have a question, ma'am. Uh, yes, how much flexibility do, do the teachers have in reference to uh, making sure that the gradual release of responsibility occurs. Uh, I've always been concerned with, the, uh, with that particular aspect or element of teaching because uh, sometimes in my prior experiences, and I think maybe Mr. Spinoza also, also will account for that, uh, uh, will understand is that sometimes uh, there's a lot of pressure put in the teachers to go through the process when maybe the actual uh, activity might take two days, maybe three, uh, especially in, in the section dealing with, we do it together or something like that, what is that thing called? The, we do the collaborative Right, uh, that it might take longer than the allotted time that uh, might be given for that day. And I was, I'm always a bit concerned about that because it, it sort of drives a teacher, it could drive a teacher mentality to where I just gotta go through the motions, get it done so that when they come and do the walkthroughs, or the actual evaluation, they see that I'm doing the whole thing instead of, hey, the focus is supposed to be our kids. And that's okay. where the lesson plan audits come in, sir. I'm sorry if you want. No, no. Uh, we're, uh, so, if, if, okay, so if we're going to talk about the lesson plan, then I'll ask you this question. Uh, are, are the teachers allowed, again, the word flexibility, to create two or three day activity lesson plans? Just one day you can do all of it. Because see, is that, it doesn't serve a purpose. Of, uh, so, Mr. Bonilla, so in terms of the district, uh, the district, we do have a set a number of walkthroughs that, that was board approved. Uh, in terms of the gradual release of responsibility, this, this framework is not linear. So that if a teacher or if a team of teachers needs to take extended time, to do exactly that. So if we have a collaborative activity that is going to, and then again, depending on the allotted time uh, for the, the subject, that is going to take one or two up to three days. When the principals are auditing the lesson plan with the team, those are the discussions they have. In terms of is the district uh, 
saying or telling the campuses you need to go through the framework for every, every day of the week? No, the answer is no. The process is not linear and it does not have to be completed in one day. That is not a, uh, a goal that the district has set for the campuses. That's exactly of that because you have to have the freedom, teachers have to have the freedom to be able to expand, especially if the, if the activity is an activity that requires extended thinking an extended application, we recognize that we have to give the students more time than 30 minutes, 45 minutes to complete the lesson successfully. We have, however, during lesson plan audits had those discussions by Candace to be incorporated and we give examples as to how it can be like the collaborative learning the uh, course of the lesson. So we have those But to address 5.3 data, data during the curved instruction, um, at the beginning of the school year, which was cycle one, we reviewed PIP PLC protocols and we rated ourselves as met expectations. Um, we assigned a kind of year to content team to PLC, so we had myself or Ms. Ms. Tapia and Mr. Serna are assisting a grade level. And we rated ourselves as made it met expectations, um, model analyzing student work and assessments, and we rated ourselves as some progress. So some barriers that we were we were encountering is that they expected not all teachers were familiar with it, so we had to provide some additional training, student artifacts analysis. Um, although the teachers have had that training, we want to provide a more different training as to how to utilize those student artifacts. Um, first and second grade assessments are not student friendly on test banks. The test banks that we're using right now is DMAC and TC, NPC, where it's, it provides a checklist. So having a trained teacher on how to create those assessments as well. And another barrier that we're encountering is, encountering is inputting that information on DMAC. We're having to train those teachers to input that information on DMAC. So some glows and grows. PLCs, of course, have been important. There for every Wednesday, and our teachers are really good about it. Whether I'm there because I do get sent on principal trainings, um, so whether I'm there or not, they they go ahead and they, they meet, and they're usually very they get very engaged, they get very into the data, and they stay a lot longer than 4:30. Each campus leader, again, as mentioned earlier, assists a grade level and provides immediate support as needed, and analyzing students. Analyzing as an assessment, sorry. Refining, refined assessment student artifacts. That's something we're, we're wanting to target. So our next step is to provide ESF template training to new teachers, especially how to fill in the portion. And we wanted to provide an, a sample. However, the link is not going to be working, but I know that BJES does have a sample already in there. So you'll be able to see the ESF template that we're utilizing. Um, ask teachers to bring student artifacts for analysis of data. So that's one of our next steps that we want to be asking teachers, okay, bring, bring in the assignments that they're doing, the assessments that they're doing. Where is the breakdown? Where are the students not getting it or um, misunderstanding? And we, we've asked teachers to create all remaining assessments so that we can start working with the backwards by design and having the end in mind whenever student, whenever the teachers do go and lesson plan. Any questions so far? This question is for Ms. Tapia. You work along with teachers, right? Yes, what, uh, I'm gonna ask the same question I asked earlier. What is it that has been working or not working with, with students? You know, first, second, and third. Uh, a lot of the things that have been working is the same. Especially with our grade level and their smaller kids, these kids, especially our first graders and our second graders, they're coming in low because of the COVID drop, right? So that small group instruction and uh, that one-to-one, -one, not necessarily the one-to-one, -one, but bringing in the students and working with them in the smaller group has helped them. Uh, having to plan, the teachers planning together and collaborating together helps as well. Uh, we do have grade levels that they practically plan every day and they collaborate with each other and look at their low SEs and how are we going to target this for the students. Basically, you know, basic things as to what's going to be our bell ringer, 
what's going to be our wrap up, what activities are we going to include in there to engage our students in their learning. So basically, those are the things that we're working with our kiddos. And so one thing that we're having to do with some teachers is um, because they started teaching during COVID year and student safety was a priority, we weren't pulling small groups. And so we were teaching as a whole. And so now readjusting that and having, okay, now we're going to start pulling small group. And even though these teachers might have taught last year, we're having, um, Ms. Babia is having to create schedules to their, where they can go and observe other teachers that do pull small groups so that they can see what that looks like. Thank you. So to address 4.1 curriculum and assessment aligned to TEAPS, we introduced full time resources to teachers and we rated ourselves as, as met expectations, provide teachers with vetted assessment expectations, we rated ourselves as met expectations because we have trained the teachers as to, okay, this is the assessment, how are you going to vet the assessment, this is what it looks like. Um, identify learning gaps by using beginning of year data and we rated ourselves as met expectations. Some barriers that we've encountered in addressing 4.1 is ELR assessments to first and second. There's limited question options. First, there are no test bank items, so they're all performance assessments, which is, which is pretty much a checklist. Like, can they do it? Can they not? Can they do it? Can they not? So it's pretty hard to enter that information. Second, no unit assessments for first to second grade, had no unit assessment from first to fourth. And the test bank items, again, those were all performance assessments and they're kind of like a check off list. And so, um, our girls and our girls. If I may right there interject, ma'am, uh, just a, you know, a little uh, recommendation, maybe an observation, mm -hmm. that uh, I can understand your concern about not having a uh, test bank, a test bank uh, for, for first grade or second grade. Right. But uh, 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 my recommendation is maybe we can start. I know, not just for ELR, but also for mathematics and based on the third grade. Uh, uh, the, no, the, the, uh, when do they start doing the, uh, what do they start doing the uh, start? Third grade. So maybe you guys can start, if you haven't already, you probably already have them, you already, you already have the uh, student artifacts or the, the benchmarks that you can scan them by, by uh, oh shoot, it's so long since I've, I've been out, out of there, uh, uh, there you go. Um, uh, that you can actually prune by, by, the, by those, uh, again? Teeks or teeks. yeah. Um, and, uh, it, you know, put them together, the scan them, put them all together. And I know we got the technology for that kind of stuff. And that way, I mean, maybe it's not gonna help us for this year, but next year's first graders, Next year, second graders will we'll have a will have a basic uh, test bank. And so, what we have done and what we started doing is, I did sit with the first grade team this last POC, and I kind of walked them through looking at the year at a glance and the uh, TCMPC, and kind of looking at those peaks and saying, okay, how can we make this peak? How can we put it in in an assessment form? And so, Ms. Laka is also collecting a binder to where we can put all those assessments and collect them all and um, making sure also that the lesson plans are in there that target those assessments. So we're collecting the binder that way for grade levels to do exactly that, to ensure that we, we don't encounter this situation next year. It's gonna, uh, uh, my experience is it's gonna require a lot of cut and paste, Techno te technologically, but it's gonna require a lot of cut and, and paste. Create, so you can uh, do them by, by TEKS and learning expectations, uh, but yeah. Um, so for second grade, the beginning unit five assessments are in case resource, so the, those test banks are already, those test assessments are already there. Through PLC, admin models, vetting assessments, we provided opportunities for data digs in PLCs and match. Um, we used iStation for first and second, second, and we used the benchmark data for third, and they have created accelerated learning groups to where they know which students they need to pull in small groups. So our next step is to revamp the master schedule to include an accelerated learning block in ER and math for all grade levels because right now we do have an accelerated learning block for reading and math and all math has an accelerated learning block and we want to make sure that all grade levels have for both for both ER and math. At the very bottom, well, I don't know if you've gone there. Go ahead, finish. So 
provide opportunities for tutoring for third targeting tier two, and we've already started that. My question now, with, with assessment, are you identifying your tier one, tier two, tier three students? So for for first and second, we provided I station, we use the I station data, and for third, we use the plan card data. And so we, we pulled that data on BMAC, and we looked at the, the quintiles, and we checked to see, okay, who was this close to meeting, to meeting approaches? And so these are the students that we are targeting for So, today. but you're going to target them on benchmarks or on reading scores? On benchmarks and reading scores. So we're looking at all the data as a whole. So like right now, I mean, especially, I know in first, some of them are just starting to read. Good. But in second and third, I mean, you all have identified a reading score for each student. We have identified those struggling readers, and they are working on pulling them in groups throughout the day. Because as um, Ms. Andy mentioned earlier, Ms. Guerrero mentioned earlier, is that these students, the strugglers, are tired by the end of the day. So we don't want to kind of make the day longer for them, so we're targeting them during the school, regular school hours. So for first and second, we're trying to build up their stamina to endure the full school day. So that's where we're at there. But in third grade, I mean, uh, in school for the students, are you going to be testing with the star? I mean, you know exactly, I mean, the reading level to see what, how, how they're reading then. So if you go to the next slide, and I'll just present the data and you can like, process it and ask a little bit more. Um, on math, for the math benchmark, in 17-18, those, the third graders that assessed at the beginning of the year were at 50%. In 18-19, they were at 33%. In 19-20, they were at 37%. And then there was that COVID year where they didn't assess. And so this time, we're at 26%. So if we look at the 2019, the star release by itself, just the star release, that actual star that, that was taken and was released in 18-19, of course, and 68% passed of third graders, 68% of those students passed at the end of the school year when they tested in May. So that same test was used in 1920 as a spring benchmark. So 53% of those students passed. We used it at the beginning of the year benchmark in November, and we had 26% passed. That's the data that we have. So we looked at we looked at the quintiles and we we identified those students that missed it by five or less questions, and we identified 41 students that missed it by five or less. And that if they would have met approaches... So you're focusing on those students that missed it. The these are the students that were already made for tutoring. So these are the students that are tutoring right now. We would have been at 63%. So three, seven, seven, 17, 18, at the beginning of the, those that, um, the third graders that assessed in 17-18 um, were at 19% in 18-19, 39%, 19-20, 49%, and then 22 right now, they're at 32%. So if we look at the same star release in 18-19 when it was first released, 55% of those third graders passed. 19-20 in spring break, uh, sorry, spring break, yeah, let's go to spring break. <laughs> So in the spring benchmark, 57% assessed, and this was this was assessed in like March. And right now we're using that same assessment. We have 32% passing. We've identified 27 students that missed it by five or less. Uh, we put us at a 56%. These are the students and some. We went ahead and got some of those from the other quintile because we wanted to make sure that we had at least five students per teacher. And so these are the students that for sure are tutored our tutoring, that would have put us at 56%. So, looking at it a little bit more in depth and in a different, with a different lens, looking at approaches, meets, and masters. This is reading for approaches, meets, and masters. The star assessment that was used. Last year, when the students assessed at the end of the school year, you don't have this one, I'm sorry about that. Like, at this one, I kind of, it is on our campus uh, planning tool. This is the data tab on our campus planning control. So she just passed this out to you. So um, those students that were at approaches at the end of the year, last year's third graders 
were at 42%, which was 49 students. Those students that met, were at meet was at 14%, those were 16 students. The students that were at master's, those were 4%, those were five students. This is the reading data. Now we're looking at the beginning of year data, we use the 2019 release. This is, these are our current third graders that test right now in November. So on approaches, we had 19%, which were 21 students. At meets, we had 7%, which is eight students. And at masters, we had 6%, which is seven students. So this is the beginning of year, these are our current third graders. For math, again, approaches, meets, and masters, those students at the end of year third grade, when they assessed at the end of year last year, 40% were at approaches, which were 48 students, 11% were at meets, which is 13 students, and 3% were at masters, which is four students. Now our beginning of year, current third graders, 23%, which is 26 students, were at approaches, 3%, which is three students, were at meets and Masters, we had done. That, that's our data right now. So, Ms. Lawton? Sorry, for 10 minutes. Or <laughs> okay, so uh, discuss opportunities for instructional rounds and feedback, created opportunities for teachers to do learning walks and teacher to teacher, what that entails is, you know, teachers will say, I would like to see another teacher doing this, doing that. Along with the IC and DTR, I was able to schedule some of uh, the uh, meeting with one of the teachers, give them some documents to keep record, meet with them and say, how did it go? These are some things I want to implement, gather resources for them, help them out, go back and see how things are going. Uh, barriers to instructional rounds, limited classroom observations, and then create a, a feedback template to give to the teachers. I mean, making little walkthroughs and just leaving little notes and during your class, little things like that, but nothing formal. Uh, next steps, as a leadership team, we have created a schedule that uh, includes a list of teachers to be observed. I am part of that list, along with my admin team. Uh, written feedback that will be provided to teachers. Share the feedback on the document with the teachers. Girls, more instructional rounds, and immediate feedback to teachers. I've given them, like I said, just little notes in their in their doors, you know, thank you for letting me visit your classroom, thank you for letting me see you all learning today, mainly to the students. It hasn't really been to the teacher. Uh, Gloves, ensuring that all students are assisted in group and class and isolation as necessary. Provide needed materials for teachers, whether it's manipulatives, uh, resources, any things that the teachers need. Uh, guiding rate levels through the backwards by design, uh, writing assessments, creating assessments, completing the ESF forms, helping <coughs> with any areas that they need most uh, parts of the ESF form, running DMAC reports, entering keys for DMACs, content materials and resources, scope of sequence, pacing calendar, technology programs, and provide any information as far when I get uh, emails. And teachers are, you know, uh, just not, yeah, I don't have enough resources for social studies, what can I use? If I have a PD that I've got, I'll forward that email to the teachers and some will take advantage of the invitations and some will not. So, uh, questions? How, uh, I noticed you guys mentioned the DMAC and I like DMAC, okay? It's very, very uh, constructive and instructive too. Uh, uh, do you guys compare, uh, like, I know that every class is different, okay? Last year's third graders were different from the ones. From this year, next year's third graders are gonna be different. However, they're all gonna get tested for with the same student objectives or student expectations. And uh, do you guys go into a DMAC and look at which student expectations last year's third graders had compared to the ones that you have right now because you use this, you use that test as a benchmark. Are they having difficulty with the, the same uh, student expectations? And if, if they are, then maybe that's something you could, you could focus on as a remedial part because we're gonna have trouble when they actually take the, the actual star. And okay. the, the accumulation of that data, uh, if you follow it, you track it, uh, it, it, it helps. You guys get into 
what, what's the uh, uh, professional learning community at your level? What do you guys do at the at those learning communities? Um, what do you guys do? It depends on what we want to target. For example, what you're just saying right now, we did uh, myself and Miss Fuente. We got together with the third grade team and we looked at the ELR star release, the 2019 star release, and we kind of asked, like, okay, so we're teaching inference, inferring, inference, and all that. And so we went through the whole test, the entire test, and we pulled out those specific ones that were, in, that were for infer. And so the way we're teaching is we're teaching, okay, um, how do we infer, or how do, and we're using the words inferring, we're using the words infer, we're using all those words. However, when we looked at the 2019 star release test, um, at the point of the star release test, we noticed that nowhere does it ask the word infer. The word infer, inference, inferencing does not come up, yet that's how we've been teaching it all this time. So we talked about different clue words and how um, those those specific words that they're using in the star release test and how we need to start teaching using those. Now, Ms. Tapia was going to go into that lead forward. Yes, and as a matter of fact, we were just talking about Mr. Monia. Uh, we had an IC meeting with Ms. Verdes, and that's exactly what she said. Go CBA to CBA, and let's look at those SEs and where is it that are we improving on it? Are we going below? What is it that we need to look at? And look at those questions to see, okay, how are we teaching that particular essay to make sure that we're targeting how the test is asking. Not necessarily teach to the test, but how is the test asking that particular question? For example, the one that uh, Mr. said, inferencing. It could be a simple paragraph two to three. What was the purpose of these two, three paragraphs that the author included in the passage? So that the student has to infer why those two paragraphs were used. What was the purpose of him adding those two paragraphs to the passage? And they didn't say infer, but the student does have to infer. So that's, that's a training we have with the donors. So those are things that we have to, to discuss with the teachers. But yes, that's one thing. And our teachers are familiar with that document. Our yep. third grade teachers are. If you guys are doing that in the professional learning communities, that's good because it's a step in the right direction uh, yes, when you have those discussions. And, and looking at assessments. And I saw you sort of quote qualify teaching to the test. Listen, ma'am, uh, uh, the state of Texas hires teachers to create those tests. Okay, so uh, when you're looking at the tests and, and you analyze them, don't feel bad about it. Hey, you know what? This thing's telling me that maybe this question is going to be uh, thrown, or this SC is going to be thrown out again because they're supposed to they're supposed to test all the all the ticks, but, but they don't. Cause the, we all know it's not possible, no. but they do. They will focus on certain ones, and they'll come up yes. over and over and over and over and over. And we noticed that inverse is one of the ones that comes up over and over. Now math is always. All right, it's always going to come up. <laughs> it's always going <laughs> to come up. Place. That was hard to kind of hone in, like which one's going to be and miss. Uh, Martinez had gone over to our campus, and so we kind of looked at that data as well kind of with the third grade team, and we're like, okay, math is all over the place. It's hard to identify. This one's going to be. Um, this is going to be tested again, this is going to be tested again. However, we have identified those that are far being ever tested. So we looked at that. Now, um, Mr. Amada over there sent uh, me a timer for five minutes, and I'm way past that. <laughs> 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 However, we wanted to give you actual numbers, so Ms. Puente went ahead and created these, these charts for you to see actual numbers. And this is our overall campus um, for, for LDC and for our math and reading. This is our overall data. Can you go to the next slide? This really focuses on first grade, and we've got September, October, November, December, and it also tells you on the bottom how many students were assessed that time and how the number increased or decreased. So this one's for math, this one's for reading, this one focuses on second grade, again the same concept or the same um, thing, September 101 students, and it tells you how many students were actually assessed, where they actually fell, and how many, how many students fell. Instead of giving you percentages, we wanted to give you actual numbers. And this is third grade, same thing. Now this is one that you don't have that we provided as an insert in your packet. Uh, I like this, I like the 
V's better than those. Uh, they, put, they throw me off. I got vision problems. And it's really just telling you, okay, there's an upward trajectory when you look at that line. You want to see that yeah. upward tra trajectory and so that it's, it's going. Like, uh, if, if I look at this here, uh, I see that in the overall math third for November, the tier threes went up. Did we, did we in our learning communities uh, come back and say, why, what, where did our kids have trouble here in this one? Because uh, uh, the kids were showing progress from September to October, but then all of a sudden, whatever, whatever concept you guys uh, did the CBAs on for November, the kids had difficulty. More kids had difficulty. And that's exactly what we were talking about, because she's like, hey, look at this. And I'm like, okay, we talk, and we talked to our math team, and they're like, yes, Ms. Tapia, but if you look, the students are growing, and this is why this one helps, because it shows you that even though our numbers, or it looks redder, our kids' trajectory in math is going. So that's that's where this helps. Even though it's hard to understand, it helps. It doesn't help me. <laughs> Morales is very, very helpful because 
we can now, if I'm in a classroom, we can cover the campus. If she's in the classroom, I am not in the classroom. And so there is always somebody making sure that uh, one of us is in the classroom one of, and one of us is uh, handling what needs to be handled. A calendar for the principal, vice principal, instructional coach for observations, instructional rounds, and also in the calendar, sectioned off time for feedback because that's the part that we're saying that, okay, we get to go in there, let's say that we do get to do that part and we do write up our notes, but we actually need to calendar in the feedback time because that's the part that's kind of uh, where we've been lacking. Goals, we do have common planning time for fifth grade. The lesson plan templates are designed with the gradual release in mind and there will be a sample after that. Uh, we do need that regular lesson feedback, specifically because if necessary, teachers do need that feedback to make adjustments. Uh, it's what we want to be seeing in the classroom, we need to be letting the teachers know about it explicitly. Continue PLC on gradual release of a responsibility instruction model. Uh, fourth grade, we need to schedule more time for that team to meet because they do not have a plan, uh, common planning time. Next one. So in the lesson plan template, here is a math lesson plan template, and we have the gradual release. And so we do look at the teachers, and as Mr. Monia said earlier, it's not always every day exactly. It does depend on the activities that the teachers plan that's more effective for the students, the concepts that are being taught, and so that, that, um, that those essays are learned. This is a reading lesson plan template. And in reading, you have the five different strands, reading, vocabulary, grammar, uh, language. And so the same thing on this lesson plan, you have your content objective, your language objective, and then you have the gradual release of responsibility. So it's a visual reminder for the teachers as they're planning, okay, I need to make sure this activity has to follow within what the uh, instructional part is or what the independent learning is. That you do it together, it's not just always just, okay, pair up the kids, two, two kids or three kids. Um, there is a specific content has to be uh, covered. It has to be academic conversations. 1.5, the PLCs will be done at a weekly basis. Data analysis process will be refined to include the view of student artifacts. And student artifacts is student work including CBAs and interim assessments to identify what is that corrective instruction that needs to be occurring. Identify trends and misconceptions. Where is it that the students are uh, losing a concept? Is it one classroom? Is it all of the fourth grade math class? Is it all of the fifth grade reading class? So what is uh, being able to target that to determine the root cause for why students didn't learn that particular concept? For that, this one we give ourselves partially implemented. Again, the barriers of time, interruptions, frequency of meetings. Uh, for the next steps, more structured PLC agendas, establish norms for PLCs, kind of a checklist of what we want to make sure gets covered every time. Uh, and then the ESF 5.3 template, we're going to look at that one next. Close that structured 5.3 form. Um, it was revised a little bit from what uh, Ms. Diaz had before. One of the reasons we do have a new staff with the realignment and the new teachers that we had on campus, we kind of wanted to, okay, let's just kind of get to the meat of this document and what we really want the teachers to focus on. Uh, we have increased discourse among academic teams. When the teachers sit down and work on this form, it, it forces them to have these specific conversations. And then PLC, when we have to do certain PLCs, even though we are a new team, if you will, with new uh, people on the campus, uh, we do have very veteran teachers. And so when we had to do a CAMI presentation last week or two, week, two Wednesdays ago, um, Ms. Nelson just went to those teachers and she said, okay, can you, can you show what you do with CAMI to the rest of the campus? And so they did that on a PLC. Rose, provide timely feedback, again, so that they can make any necessary edits to those exams. Like Mr. Bonilla, you were saying, we have to teach what the students are going to be assessed on. And so we have to look at that assessment. And part of our role is when we look at those tests, 
that we're looking at those release questions specifically. How are those standards assessed on the test and are we giving the students uh, adequate examples to practice those questions? Improved student artifact review strategy, timely completion of the vetted CBAs. So this is page one of our Selective Schools Framework 5.3 Data Driven Instruction. And so the very first thing teachers have to do, and this is backwards by design, we can't just, okay, we're going to teach and then I'm going to come up with the test at the end. The test comes first. And that test has to be produced again to, is for the test, to the rigor of what the students are going to encounter on STAR. So what are the SDs that this particular test is going to assess? Then the students go to leap forward. There's a STAR frequency distribution chart. How many times the particular SDs that's on that test, is it assessed in the real STAR on the release test? So the teachers review that. Ma'am, pause right there. Uh, yes. That's basically what I was talking about when I was made that, those comments. Uh, 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 hold on. Uh, does uh, DMAC have, have that uh, chart? No, this a star? is on lead forward. Uh, but it can't be, it's not, it's not there, it's not found in, in, in DMAC where it presents you the, the TEKS that were tested 2021, 2020, 2019, 2018. Not in DMAC. In the lead forward, there's a chart there that tells okay, you. Okay, so the, that, that thing exists. Right. Yes, it does. But in the DMAC, we have our test where we have all these, that's where we type in the keys and the SEs for each question. And so you come back and you look at, okay, how many times is that question assessed? So again, the more times a question is assessed or it has been seen on a star release test, we want to make sure, again, and it's just working with the numbers, that those that our students are getting plenty of practice with those questions. So this particular question on this template kind of guides the teachers to looking at that. Okay, how many times has this question been assessed? How many different ways has this question been assessed? Uh, part three, any other questions on this part, sir? Uh, the backwards by design to be completed. So this is where the students, the teachers take the test. This is the vetting the assessment part. Take the test as if you are a student, but also from the lens of a teacher taking notes and planning for instruction. The goal, what is the percent of students, including subgroups, that will demonstrate mastery on this exam? What, what items and concepts will the students likely experience difficulty with? So as the teachers are taking that test as a student, they go by and they start pinpointing those things. And again, that is to start thinking, what activities do I need to create in my classroom to foster that the students are learning these concepts? Uh, and so these are the questions. And this is what the teacher has typed in. We don't have the test in front of us, but this is what this teacher fills out in response to those questions. And then they have the checkpoints at three weeks. And so again, they create that checkpoint from star uh, formatted questions. Any questions on that first one? Okay, due to instructional gaps, it's essential the curriculum and assessment be rigorous and aligned with an emphasis on readiness standards. And for this one, we have said that it is partially implemented. Again, time constraints to vet. And a lot of it, we're, 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 Benito Juarez is kind of the time, but we're moving forward with that. Again, with our added vice principal, uh, we do have more time to do this. And since we're looking at the first three months, um, this is what we were basing it on. Uh, next steps, monitor assessments closely. I see support new teachers and assessment design to appropriate level of rigor. Uh, GLOWS, yeah, it's, we have our scope and sequence, pacing calendars, GROWS, the I station monthly assessment. Uh, we want to keep up with that. We started it, and as we're looking at that data, we're hoping that that's going to turn into a GLOW as well. Frequent check-ins with planning teams on content and pacing calendar. Um, that is where sometimes if we hear, well, how far behind are we? We set a calendar at the beginning of the year. Because come test time, all of those SCs are going to be assessed. We want to make sure that we've talked them. So in that pacing calendar, if we start staying too far behind, then we have to reconcile that and make sure those students are still getting the, that instruction. Any questions? OK. I'm going to have, and I'm going to start with barriers first. Because I need to state right up front that a lot of our teaching staff is new on our campus. And that's been the greatest challenge of all, trying to help 
uniformly across the campus. We did have the restructuring, so the fourth grade teachers came up to our campus. There were a lot of new procedures, policies, systems in place that we had to go through at the beginning of the year. It was quite a challenge uh, with the frequency of the rounds and the feedback, not as often as I wanted to, and the priorities in using conference minutes. That is a list that I came up with, and I just wanted to mention, I did not include it, but when we talk about a conference period for a teacher, and we sat down with the teachers, and what is it that you need to get done, and I just want to go over it verbally. Uh, physical needs, restroom is first. We need to go to the restroom, those are minutes. Arms, if there's arms, they're out. Collaboration meetings with special pops, whether it's dyslexia, SPED, whatever, they have to meet. Lesson planning and design, data digs, research, and human reports, ESF papers that you saw up here, intervention preparation, posting grades, preparing materials for next day's lessons, creating anchor charts, exploring resources, ice station, mentoring minds, epic, lead works, class kit, cami, literature for connected text, or parental contacts, and the list goes on. So that is the limited amount of time for all of those things that hopefully they can get to. There are so many priorities, there are a lot of challenges. And valuable to that is, of course, meeting with the students, with the teachers. This, I only put it in there because at the beginning of the first semester, it was a challenge to have enough people. We had a lot of uh, a key slot and another in inclusion. And so there was a lot of struggle trying to keep up with managing how to make sure that the rooms function if Substitutes came in and work had to be ready, and I had a new teacher, and Ms. Burns is aware of this, and I had a challenge where I had to be there because of class management, a brand new teacher that needed assistance in the classroom. That took up a lot of time also. So there were a lot of uh, really uh, dire crisis needs that was taking place. Luckily, thankfully, this is eliminated. We have a lot of people that are now coming in and they're working with us. We don't have that substitute shortage anymore like we had in the first couple of months. We have to go through all of this. Orientation, instructional practices and procedures, negotiation, I mean expectation non-negotiables, the materials, the resources with all the new teachers, including the state. Luckily they came in, they were willing, they were being trained on as much as they could. You can't put it all on the table at one time. It has to be little by little. Imagine new teachers trying to gain positive everything and then give them a sender and grades and intervention and everything else. It's a challenge. It's a big challenge. A lot of next steps, scheduled instructional rounds, timely feedback, as Ms. Pereira said, coaching cycle sessions with follow-up progress monitoring meetings with administrators. Are we being impactful? Is it moving forward? Added training to new teachers. I verified with Ms. Briones, and I also talked to the teachers. They're willing to come in. Those new teachers that need more assistance, more time with all of this, they're willing to come in. That's a plus for us. Present lead forward growth template to BJPS teachers. I think that's going to be super impactful, which is what the training that we were receiving that we're sharing among the ICs of, of campuses strengthening our district. Lots of loads. This is most important. Resilient and receptive. Willingness to learn. Open to ideas. Open to they can come to me and they seek me out for assistance, for you know, anything that they need, they know they can come and find help for whatever reason they're lacking. Creating CBAs that match the rigor of star, igniting and implementing targeted intervention. This is a big deal. Especially with the teacher, you know, what, what can I use? What can I do? You mentioned what strategies? What will, well, you have to be very specific with your tiers. It's not going to be the same uh, intervention for your tier ones and twos for growth as it is for your tier threes. So, helping them understand how the specificity of what you need in the classroom, addressing the teachers and the CSEs. Big challenge. Using research based strategies effectively, and we don't want to forget to celebrate student growth because that's a big deal. The motivational part of the students, I mean, it can't be just push, 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 and not celebrate. They love to celebrate. And these uh, 12 days of Christmas, it really helped with attendance and the mood on the campus, the culture and climate. I'm gonna say it was really positive. They really enjoyed themselves. 
And that's what we want. Come to school and learn. We're going to push you, but enjoy yourself. Our fall benchmark data looks like this. We also did the miss by one to five questions. Because yes, it does look a little bit dismal. But coming off of a COVID, a COVID transitional year from virtual to on campus, student insecurities, SEL challenges, we're seeing it, we're feeling it. We take hope with all of this. This right here, I want to celebrate. These are two brand new people on our campus. And they are smart and they take advice. And I can give them, uh, Ms. Morales and I were having a conversation, I give them a suggestion or they come and seek me out, they implement it. And look, it's happening. It's happening with these two. We celebrate that. And when we talk about vetted exams, I shared with Ms. Bermea, when we vet the exams, they're doing a great job. They're understanding what we're talking about when we say big detour and fine, but we need to help us too. This one here, I have my notes, and on the science, science is new to them, limited opportunities for hands-on and lab experiments with the year that we were out of the gap. And virtual science, uh, virtual learning, set us back with it. Are we making gains? Yes. And can we do it? Yes. Because we're going to go, I take that as an almost 50%, but we're going to get these kids, we're going to get these kids to pass, to grow. Not just pass, but to grow. And when we presented this to the teachers, we kind of said, okay, we have the next benchmark scheduled for February. And so when we looked at this, we said, okay, let's, Let's our goal be that we move beyond the five questions so that these percentages are actually higher in February because then when we look at the real star test, then hopefully it'll be even higher than that. But the teachers, when they saw how this is just one between one and five questions, then how much farther our percentages would go. But again, this is the October benchmark. So not even half a semester. And so, you know, we do have to discuss that. We did look at okay, which SCs, the teachers did an analysis. These are the SCs that we taught, and these are the SCs that, if you just uh, separate those SCs, how did the students do? And so, even in that, there were some where the teachers saw, okay, I'm going to have to go back and reteach this again because the students still didn't understand it. And then there was a lot of, okay, they got it. We can move forward. So, it's always constantly looking back at the data, looking back at the questions. What is it that the students still need? What needs to be retaught so that we can keep the kids growing? And on this one, unfortunately, you can't see the growth chart, which is going to make a real difference with us. It places the students into the groups, and from there, specific targeted intervention will be scheduled by the teachers to promote growth and the needed tier interventions that will take place for those students. So for cycle two, the next three months, we want to prioritize, prioritize in the 5.1 that I do independently. Uh, one of the things that I did is in the, our, our walkthrough form, I've added the actual, again, because we have some new teachers. So when they get their feedback, they have the four, um, they have the four um, focus intervention and then a description, guided instruction and a description, collaborative learning, independent learning. And so if it goes back and forth so that they can see, okay, where am I doing this part of the gradual release? Just to help them see a little bit in the feedback, okay, I need to either do more or what is missing, but it's on there explicitly. Teachers attend PLCs with the student sample work, focus on misconceptions. Um, teachers will determine if there was a minor misconception or if it's a whole skill or concept that needs to be retaught. And 4.1, identifying learning gaps using the fall benchmark to plan aligned instruction to address identified gaps. Progress monitoring will occur every three weeks. Any questions? Yes, I'm going to ask the same question to Ms. Garza. Uh, what have you identified? You mentioned celebrating successes, which is great, but what other, uh, what have you identified where you see student growth that we might or help with or whatever, because I'm already hearing a certain theme. I'm just curious as to what have you seen that's working? A lot of the teacher, student, building a rapport and communication, making them uh, 
feel comfortable and supported within the classroom, helping them, the small group that you were talking about, that's helping a great deal in moving them forward. A lot of the positivity on we're working together, we're gonna reach a goal, we're here to help you. All of those factors come in. If the student is not comfortable, because I come from the bilingual, and if the effective domain, if you don't reach the effective domain of the student, you're not gonna to get to the cognitive. It's just not gonna happen. The student has to be in the classroom, present to receive the instruction. So we work a lot with the students and the, te I mean the teachers, understanding that, let's see, the feeling that we're getting in the classroom it has to be the teacher is teaching and the students are learning. Yes, there's been a lot of challenges, but we have, in fact, the teacher of the month that we just... Did you have to me? There's something there that the counselor put on there that's specific to what we're working with the teachers to try to help so that the students will put the effort in because that's what's needed, the effort for them to be able, the struggles I've heard, the, uh, the ICs, I think somebody mentioned about how they're tired, I think is what I mean, they're tired at the end of the day. You can't just keep pushing, 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 and then expect them to stay till 4.30, and they're gonna be the best, they're not. <laughs> so what are we doing? We talked about brain bridge, remember we heard that Ms. Benavides' student said, she knows we work hard, and remembers to give, to give us brain breaks. She is always nice to everybody. So she knows there's got to be teach, celebrate, relax, breathe, let's take it in. This is what the counselor said about her. In this transitional year between virtual and on-campus learning, Mrs. Benavides has been and continues to be vigilant in closing the gap in SEL, social emotional learning, among all of our Benito White students. So we evidence that we have more and more people getting on board. We have, we have to celebrate. We have to celebrate the growth. I think there's going to be a lot of transition in the new year. I'm very hopeful. I shared it. Uh, the IC, you will agree with me. We all feel that this is going to be very impactful. Being putting those uh, tiers in groups and addressing their needs. Celebrate. Thank you, ma'am. May I make a suggestion? Uh, it's, I have to say it because it's been uh, in my mind since. Uh, I understand about the CBAs that is, well, they're constructed to uh, assess what's being taught at that moment. Okay. Uh, my recommendation that that's fine and dandy. Okay. I understand about CBAs, uh, but maybe to help you with the review of prior uh, essays that the kids have been tutoring on or whatever. Maybe you can add a couple of those questions to your CBAs, and uh, for those of you that know that know me, you know, my grade, to me, grades are, are no big deal. Uh, but I know that at, starting at fourth grade and fifth grade, self-esteem is very important because uh, you're beginning to go through those stages that we all go through. And when they get a, a 110, 105, I know it picks them up. And, uh, I'm sure it's, uh, we as two teachers. It won't hurt us to give 105 or 100. So it might be a, a way to help you help the kids review a difficult essay that they're having a hard time on. And that was in conversation with Ms. Morales, because I know it's a package with Mr. Alvarado, that they used to add those essays on. And you mentioned something that we have been discussing, and that is going to be in the works too. Yes, to spiraling on the essays, the teachers finalizing the essays, but That's then the we're going to assess them all. That's what I was looking for. Time is monitoring. It's going to be uh, impactful. Thank you. Okay. Do we need in five minutes? <laughs> five minutes. Now I feel the pressure. <laughs> Your own time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, while well, I'm setting that up, uh, this is Ms. Jones, our district principal, and Ms. Jones, our district principal. Um, Mr. Mata was there at the beginning of the summer, uh, or in the middle of the summer, when we all went through there, and I just hope that everybody understands 
that this was a district initiative. I don't think we put that much emphasis on it when Mr. Ramirez came in. And us as new principals and everything, we all jumped on board. And we decided that we were all going to jump on the same uh, uh, effective schools framework. And I'm, to add to I'm, that, uh, it is some work. That, that, that was some work. <laughs> I was taking my notes, too. So uh, Yeah, <laughs> so I, I appreciate Mr. Mata being there with us and, and going uh, step to step with us. Uh, but again, we all chose 5.1, we all chose 5.3, and then we were given the choice to kind of where we want to develop. Here at the junior high, we said we wanted to do 1.1, uh, which was develop campus instructional leaders. Uh, one of the things that I feel that I still need to grow, and uh, as a campus, we still need to grow, is um, as uh, for campus instructional leaders to have clear written and tra uh, transparent roles and responsibilities pretty much to grow academically. Um, when I became uh, principal, and I told, going back to Ms. Uh, Garcia's here, um, but being in the role of assistant principal to principal is totally different. It's totally different. I was spending my days dealing with students and parents and all that stuff. So I felt that I still needed to grow academically when they took on the principal. It was like, whoa, totally different. And Ms. Gomez is gonna be kind of flying at me in this meeting also because she's in that role right now. Uh, me and Ms. Jones, we tackle all the academics and, and we're learning from each other. But when one of the school board members uh, approached me, uh, just in, in talks, and, and I always said, we need a person that is strong in academics to help us grow into this. And I am very appreciative, and I'm not saying that just because but with the guidance of Ms. Briones, you know, it, it takes that certain person to take you to that next level. Um, and right now, as you can see, everybody, we're all grown and, and, and we're all seeing it. And it's a matter of not saying, and it's the same thing, I guess you could say. Not only are we being told, you know, let's do this, you know, but as also being held accountable as to having those feedback meetings um, that you see the theme of all the campuses saying we got to come back and adjust. So 1.1 is, is big for us. 5.1 uh, the same, uh, same thing as everybody else pretty much. Um, barriers, unscheduled interruptions, keeping admin from uh, uh, sticking to observation schedules, attending auditing sessions, Let's plan audit templates, uh, you know, a lot of these things, and we got to understand the, the transition, and also all the, um, not only teachers were new, but administrators were new to certain roles, things were shifting at the beginning, and the implementation of a lot of the things that Ms. Briones, Ms. Martinez, and everybody else at Central Office is trying to accomplish, um, some of these things took time to put into place, and we're still learning them, you know? So that's part of the barriers that we have is, yes, we're trying to implement them, but at the same time, Ms. Briones and everybody else at Central is teaching us, and then we got to take it back to our campus and implement it. So it's taking time, but I think we're to, uh, headed in the right direction. Um, next steps, continue with lesson plan audits and feedback and dog walkthroughs, checking to see how lesson plans transitions into the classroom. Some of our goals, um, Ms. Martinez and Ms. Briones have been at our campus, and I'm the type of person that I'm gonna bring them as much as I can into our campus, and I'm happy that they've been at our campus, they've been visiting our campus, um, and I can rest assure that they uh, know that we have implemented as much of the things that they've asked of, of, of us, um, the GGR, uh, the things, but it's not only about implementing them, and, and but some of, one of the things that we were held accountable when we had our principals review was, okay, you've told me this, you've told me that, show me. And then that's where we're like, uh, I didn't know that that, that was a, an expectation. So it's a learning tool, right? It's a learning tool. We, we learn from it. Uh, OK, I thought I was doing good, but I can do better. So one of the things is, as you can see, what kind of schedule did we do? You can see that all the principals, we all went back 
and we all created schedules, and, but that was something that was a feedback from central office, and that's something that we put in and, and we drove from it. Uh, 5.3, uh, the level implementation, uh, we said we've implemented, but it's still urgent. Everything that we're doing is urgent and that we need to do. Uh, barriers, again, changes to the district assessment calendar. We went from, we should have had a boy, a moy, and a boy, uh, beginning of the year, middle of the year, end of the year, and we transitioned from, uh, to, from that to a fall benchmark to a spring benchmark. So then we had to do a couple of adjustments on there too. Uh, some of the benchmark data that we did was we took a very early benchmark. Uh, most, uh, most of the time we took it in December, this time we took it in October. So we were about a month and a half ahead of schedule on that. Um, continue training. Uh, again, everything that we're learning from central office, all the expectations, we're still learning ourselves. I mean, you know, uh, Ms. Briones uh, gave us at the summer, uh, Mr. Ramirez, they gave us uh, data, Drive by Data 2.0, and then all of a sudden Ms. Martinez shows up with Driven by Data 3.0. So, we, you know, we got to go back and read the book. <laughs> we got to go back and read the book and, and get familiar with it. But next steps, analyze student data from the Leap Forward template. And Mr. Bonia, I, we work together and, and, you know, all the questions that we had, is, I know that we're coming from. But DMAC and Leap Forward pretty much go hand in hand. We use it, you know, we use one. DMAC one day and we use the forward the next day. So it, it, it's still a really good tool. Um, the four growth templates have allowed us to identify students uh, who need uh, long-term intervention and short-term intervention uh, to show growth. Teachers are familiar with data-driven template and are using it. Some growth, set aside time for planning uh, backwards by design to ensure lesson plans and CBAs are aligned work on ways to analyze tier one, tier three students, uh, enrichment progress, and ensure continue to see the growth. So that's, uh, what was the purpose that's of can, That's how you can connect those tier three kids to the CBAs. Yes, sir. And don't those um, new question at the end. So one of the things, uh, a couple of years ago with uh, previous administration, um, they introduced us to, to a program which was the Loman Consulting, and one of the things that, that we learned from that was everything that had to do with scaffolding and always bringing uh, the prior data back. So most of our teachers, I bought the program for all our core, uh, and Ms. Morales, I'm glad that Ms. Morales uh, was able to share that with Benito Juarez, but scaffolding is a big part of that program where we get to identify uh, the weak SEs or SEs uh, that students need, and we continue to scaffold those either in the class or through our RTI classes. Sir, Mr. Spinozay, what, what was the purpose of changing the benchmarks to the fall and how has it helped you or the campus or? Uh, well, the thing was, uh, we there were some technical issues with the program that we bought uh, or that was selected through the district. <laughs> okay, so the reason why we had to move from beginning of, from interim, which is what we had initially planned for interim assessments at the state level, was that the Cambium, which is the state assessment company, the vendors, uh, and Ascender, which is our, pro is, is our data management system, did not interface. And so by the time we reached the October benchmark dates, the interface had not been completed. So at a principal's meeting, we discussed, okay, do we want to wait two more weeks for the interface, pushing us to November, or do we move on to benchmarks using benchmarks the way we've traditionally used benchmark? And then as a, as a leadership team, they said, let's just do benchmark, and we will compare uh, of the fall benchmark, the 1920 to the spring benchmark uh, 2021, I believe. Uh, and so that's why we decided to move to benchmark. But it, it was not a limitation set by the district. It was that the interface between the two data management systems were not 100%. So well, they're going to keep it that way? or So no, so we no. moved away from the interim assessments because we wanted to be apples to apples in terms of test design. Uh, and so in the spring when we benchmark, it's going to be a benchmark. So if we would have had the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, and the end of the year, it would have been an interim test given through the state. 
uh, right. using their program. But since we moved away from that, we're going to go benchmark from release test to release test. Uh, Ms. Martinez and Ms. Brunas uh, have had the privilege to join us for our PLCs. In fact, they've allowed, uh, <coughs> shared some data with me with that. Uh, but they can see that for the most part, uh, and not for the most part, for all of us, all our teachers have bought into the expectations of what we are expecting to implement. Um, and some of the growth is, again, when, when we have our principal meetings and, and as Briones has brought to light a lot of, you know, questioning and, and a lot of stuff brings a lot of stuff to light. And, uh, being a transition year back into campus, we've had a lot of our disruptions, discipline, uh, and, and she says, if you want to spend all day having parent conferences, you can have parent conferences all day, or you can have, but we have to make time to get into the classroom. That's what the importance is. Um, so one of the things of the girls is we need to continue when we break down our data for T-tests and our instructional rounds with our instructional coach and everything, we find that we need to be more in the classroom. So that's one of the girls that we did, and that's why we created a calendar just like the real campus did. And now we're utilizing, you know, uh, what we call uh, protected time. Uh, you know, this time we drop what we're doing, we got to get into the classroom. And that's one of the tools that, that was brought to life by the residential office to guide us. You, know, you need to do this, and we need to get there. Right? And that's just a good tool. Oh, uh. um, this this year, the I see we've gotten to work a lot closer. So we're on the on the same page with a lot of things that we're doing. Ms. Fiona says set up meetings for us on Mondays when we had not had any before, when we could actually get together and talk and share ideas. So we're doing a lot of the same things. In the some of the things that I did that I did in cycle one was I made sure that I was there to have to provide teachers with lesson plan support starting in the summer. The teachers came in in the summer and they started planning. Um, I've had POC. I had after we were trained on the PO, on the, G, the GRR. I came in and I, I did a PLC test for our camp, campus. Showed them what it actually what each step of the GRR actually would look like could look like in the classroom. Um, I've had PLCs on ice station, and then Miss um, Martinez came in and did domain one for us. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we, of course, go in and do um, make sure the teachers have their classroom policies and their procedures and any kind of classroom management that they, can, they may need. Any DMAC support, if we, I have to PLC something, this is the report we're looking for, this is how you get it, this is what it looks like, this is what it can give you, what information. Um, I help them with the test bank support to help them create CBAs, where can I get questions, you know, some of the... the some of the content that's not tested, it's hard for them to find um, questions. So we, I do help, I help them with that. Of course, I create the, the keys for DMAC for the CBAs, um, support with the support during their planning time, going with them and make sure that they're using that to analyze data. Um, schedule instructional rounds on our campus administrative team schedule, scheduler or, or, or the calendar. We make sure that um, includes Feedback time for that. Too fast. I still have three minutes. Me too. Uh, and I also meet with admin to discuss growth areas for specific teachers when it's needed. I don't go and tell admin anything. They'll go into the classroom and if they see something that is concerning to them, then we will. They will. They'll meet with me and tell me you need to go and do this with this teacher. But if um, I'm not, I don't go into a classroom and find something and then go tell admin this is what they're doing wrong. I try and help them first, and it's not until admin steps in and says this is what they need, and then I, 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 um, I can address it that way. Um, set up, of course, if they have a, a certain teacher they need me to meet, work with more, set up coaching cycles for specific teachers if needed, and try to follow my, my IC daily calendar that we've set and done. Some of the barriers that I've encountered are we don't have substitutes, and sometimes in the mornings, first thing, first period, I spend my time getting the plans ready for whoever's going to be coming in, or if there's anybody even there. Um, 
I am also sometimes helping with um, technical issues with the computers not working or um, I station, we, have it, we use it second period, things like that. And then of course, um, managing my time to make sure that I get in the rounds that I need to get in. For my next steps, I'm, I'm going to follow my instructional rounds calendar. I've already, had, I've already gone into some teachers' classrooms. I've already give, left them positive feedback, and then I've scheduled a, a coaching round with them where we, we meet one on one. I have a lot. We are blessed because we don't have very many new teachers. We have a lot of veteran teachers, so so it makes the coaching is more. Um, what did you see? What could what could go better? And then they ask for suggestions from me, like, I was trying to do this, but what do you think about this? So that, that allows it allows them time to do that. Um, also, we I've, I've made it a point to observe so that I know what my, what the PLCs, the PLCs will be based on teacher needs. What do they need? I know Ms. Leona said, if these are things that the teachers need, then you need to, you need to do um, you need to base your PLCs on what the teachers are asking, what they're looking, what they need help in. Some of the goals is that our teachers are very receptive about implementing any new initiatives. They are, they just do it. You know, if they gripe, it's not in the, it's not in the school. It may be at home, somewhere else. But they are working in the in, in their classrooms and during PLCs. Data analysis is done by most of the teachers without having to probe them. Like they're already doing it without us having to tell them we need to do it or we need to turn this in. They want feedback. They want, if I go into a classroom and I don't need feedback, they'll say, um, what did you see? Did you, can you help me? What, you know, what, did, what can I, what do I need help with? Um, and we have I, the IC calendar now and the instructional rounds calendar. That is a glow too because we always said we were going to do it, but we never really did it. And nobody really like, I guess all this accountable for it, right? But now we're being held accountable too. And it's a good thing. It's actually helping us grows. I need to find ways to collect the instruction around data and share with teachers in a timely, efficient manner. Because we are, we have seven periods. If I go in third period and then I don't meet with the teacher till the next day, they're like, which period did you come in? What was I doing during that period? So I need to meet, I need to be very purposeful when I set up a um, coaching session um, right away. Um, and then I need um, some time to plan for PLCs. And then I need to make sure that when I meet with the teacher, I am utilizing their conference time because it is, that is their time. So if I'm going to meet with them, I need to be prepared, what questions I'm going to ask, how, we're gonna, how the session is going to be, because I want them to get the best out of those few minutes or however long I meet with them. Um, and then we, I, we I, I put on here a grow was to PLC the lead forward document. The growth document to discuss student growth, but I've already done that, so the teachers are familiar with that. Um, more vetting with the CBAs for rigor. We had a session with Ms. Leones where she, um, we need to refresh the different DOKs so the teachers make sure that they include all the DOKs in their CBAs. And then we need to design and implement targeted intervention for a tier one, tier two, and tier three on our growth template that we just, um, we just are starting to use. The next page. And this is just a sample of what our lesson plan looks like. I think this is a little bit right? Okay. Okay. On the lesson plan template, I know the name of the yeah, we work together, so I got to talk to you. But that's, ever since I used to work with Mr. Winnie at the high school, that was one of the questions that we had um, about the gradual release of responsibility and whether it, the whole thing had to be implemented in one day or going to be brought the What's it called? Um, I have And it. At, the, at the summer planning search, uh, I was able to speak to 20 uh, the person that was bringing us there, and that's one of the questions that I had, and she kind of agreed to what uh, we used to understand at our social study department on, on that. Probably not. Uh, <laughs> okay. The lesson plan template. That one of the things I know that Mr. Mr. Mata asked about. Yeah, Mr. Mata asked about, um, or I think it was Mr. Bonilla about the 
spiraling into the cheeks or how, what are we doing to make sure that the strategies and the things are working in the classroom? Well, one of the things that we make the teachers started doing is that they have a partner enrichment teacher. So like a math, regular math class will have an enrichment teacher. So they're planning together and whatever is it, the information is either uploaded, like we're gonna start working on this, so I need you to, to start working on this, or based on CBA data, if they're struggling with an SE, then they push that into the enrichment. And if you look at the bottom, it's included in the lesson plan, what, they, what the regular teacher wants the enrichment teacher to be working on to help her with her regular, with her tier one case. So all our students, the, the, the benefit of, of the um, personnel that Mr. Ramirez and Ms. Briones have continued to give us the support in was we were able to create a master schedule where all students had a uh, regular math class and then they had an intervention class. Uh, and same thing with our English department. Our English department, all our students go to a regular English class and they go. So whether we want to accelerate the instruction, hey, uh, next week we're doing this. Um, the enrichment class can go ahead and accelerate the students so by the time they get to their regular lesson, they already kind of had the foundation set. Or if they take a CBA and they say, hey, we really struggle with this, well, the regular class is going, but in the enrichment class, they come back and remediate. Um, so one, of the, one of the things that um, I talked to Ms., one of our, our math teachers, Ms. Gallego, sixth grade math, was that she was saying, the kids are understanding the new content I'm teaching them. They understand the content content, the new content, but it's the content that was that they need from before in order to do this, that they're struggling with that. So then that's what is pushed out into the enrichment class. And then, uh, uh, see that was one of my concerns when we first started dealing with tier one, tier two, tier three back in the, uh, the day, that, you know, we do focus on tier three kids and understand this. We need to make sure or ensure that all our kids are successful. Mm -hmm. uh, but when they got back into the classroom, how do we assess the progress they were making in, in the tutoring and the enrichment classes? And one thing that I, I did mention to some of the math and English teachers back in the day is that to add questions to the CBAs, because again, I remember very distinctly we were hammered the CBAs will only cover what you're teaching now. And I said, but why can't, why can't we kill two birds with one stone? I had a couple more questions. Anyway. So this is our benchmark data results. And I'm just going to show you, I'm going to go through the first row and just so that you know how to, how to read this. And then you all can look at it if you have questions. So like, for instance, the sixth grade math, this is our sixth graders last year. At the end of the year, they were at 36%. They finished the year at 36%. So then we're gonna look at our six graders that we have this year. These are both in red because these are the same group of kids. So in 2021, in the fall, when we took our benchmark in November, they were at 29%. This same group, when they were in fifth grade, this is what they got, 35%. So this is the same kids right here. So when they were in fifth grade, 30, they came in, 35% of them have met, had met standard, and right now on the, on the December benchmark or the November benchmark, they're 29% met standard. So that's how you look at that. And then this right here, we have, um, if we, we have 50 kids who missed it by five or less questions, and that would put us from a 29 to a 68% passing. And then we had 26 more kids that missed it by seven or less questions, and that would put us at 88%. So these are kind of like our projections, as Fiona said, are these are what you're aiming for for this for the next benchmark. We're hoping to go here. So these are the kids that we are focusing on, the kids that were right there. And that's the same thing for all these contexts. That's what that looks like. Um, one of the things uh, Mr. Espinosa asked me earlier, what was some of the benefits of taking it in October for the benchmark? Um, and as you can see, uh, normally if because these scores were COVID scores, right? So they were really low. Um, but in a regular benchmark, we normally do a little bit better. But because we took it so early, um, you know, we stayed kind of stagnant because it was real early. But one of the benefits that came on that was Ms. Briones um, brought us in a tool, uh, gauging tool from Leap Forward. And what, when we started 
putting in putting in the, the data and the students, and Ms. Jones will, will show you in a little bit. What we started noticing is names of students that were repeaters at the levels that they were in before. So one of the things is that we were able to catch those kids a little bit earlier than normal, and that we would have waited to the spring benchmark to finally identify those students. But with the tool from Leap Forward and taking it so early, now we can go back and identify those students and give them to a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, did you? Can we look at the chart? Yeah, the chart. chart. Okay. Yes. So, Miss, they brought us in for a training. Leap Forward um, was the presenter, and they have this template that's to show um, how the kids are if the kids are growing, how many points they're giving us. So what you do is you go into DMAC and you get your, your star data and your benchmark data and then you compare them to see if the student grew or if they stayed the same or if they did, didn't grow. So if you click on this page, this tab right here, and scroll up a little bit. Okay. Oh. So like if you're looking, this is the number of students that took, when they took the spring benchmark, we had 15 students that were at the master's level. And then if you look over here, you we only had one student that when he took the Bob benchmark um, grew. So one student gave us a point because he, um, he, was, he still stayed at the master's level. And then we had five students who dropped to meets out of those 15 that were at Masters, when they took their star at Benchmark, five of them regressed. So we did, if it's red, we didn't get any points for the red. And then out of those 15 students, nine of those students went from Masters to Approaches. And then uh, nobody, nobody that, that did not pass. But one of the things that's important to look at is that these right here, in the red, these are our passers from the spring 2021, and they're not giving us any points. So this number right here tells you which students, what students those are. So we took the names of these students, the t and um, I made a copy of the the rosters with the certain color, like, like if they were in the red, their name was in red. So the teachers took those and they created a chart so they could see Who's giving us a point? Who's giving us half a point? Who's not giving us any points? So they were able to put not only, there's nine kids, but they were able to put a face to that, to those nine kids. So we created charts so that they can see. And some of the, all of these kids, these are like your GT kids who were in the red. And if you look up here, we had, go up a little bit more. I'm gonna go up to the front, up to the top. We had 66 students that did not meet grade level. That means they did not pass. But out of those 66, 20, 21 of those kids gave us a point right here. So you can see how even though they didn't pass, they grew enough to give us a point. So a lot of the SPED kids were in this group and they were green. So the teachers were like, why is they green? I said, because they're growing. They may not be passing, but they're growing. So they were able to see. Pull up the special ed. Pull up the special ed. Yeah, pull up the special ed one down here at the bottom. Which one the There should be, you should scroll down right here. Let me scroll over. Yeah, this is the one I wanted you to see. Okay. So we had 13 students that were that are special ed students that did not pass. Out of those 13, we had one that went to the approaches, and six that they gave this gave us a point, and then six students that showed growth and they gave us a point. And you have that for the um, other other um, special props. And we can do it for all spot, uh, special sure. props. That's great. So, like I said, this new tool that we received, the thing I liked about it was, it was I mean, you could see the names right there, and then you can start seeing the trends of, of the students. So, it, it was a really good tool. It, it is a really good tool. So, then the next thing that we're moving to do, this was. So the reason why we tested so early was because the state was asking for baseline data. We want to know how far behind they are. So there was no need for us to test in December. The earlier that we could do it, the better the collection of data was. But as we transitioned from the big benchmark comparisons, 
Now we can, we have a different template where we can populate a unit assessment. So let's say that I'm following their master schedule and I'm doing unit assessment number seven and these are my SEs that I'm testing. And I know that I have six students that did not pass. Uh, I know that in for my remediation class, my co-teacher is going to take those SEs that those six kids were unsuccessful with and I'm going to create a checkpoint for those SEs and I'm going to reevaluate the students after whatever the designated time is going to be. And I'm going to compare unit seven to my checkpoint to see where those kids are growing and we can track the kids. So it's a very efficient uh, tool to use and we can track the kids as they, as they grow. So our goal is to move them all as close to one point as possible. They don't necessarily have to pass but in order for, for, this is for growth. We're not talking about domain one, which is student achievement. We're talking about we need to maximize the contribution that the students are making. This is a conversation that Mr. Mata and I had last week is you may have a passer that is that, you may have a student that may not pass, but that does not mean that they're not going to contribute to domain two or domain three. They can still contribute, but just like you can have a student that meets domain one who does not contribute to two or three. So we need to level the playing field and this is a really good tool to see how the kids are growing across the curriculum. So we were able, using this data, we were able to create like our tiers so then so that we could like these, this is our tier threes up here and they, would, they need long-term intervention and then your tier twos need short-term intervention along with your tier one kids that did not give us any points, they passed, but they didn't give us any points. Those kids all need to be in the green because we know they're passers. We already know they're gonna pass, but we need to make sure that they don't go from a, because it can be a little, it can be as little as from an 86 to an 84, and they're not gonna, because this master's number is 86, they get an 84, then they don't give us any points. So. I'm closing? Yeah. And there's, there's one more in there. The next slide. So then they, these are like the tiers. So in tier for sixth grade math, I'm just going to show you what one of them and then the rest will be the same. For sixth grade math in tier one, we had 12 of those 12 kids that, 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 um, that we need to, to make sure that they give us point. And these are short-term interventions. So we have a second period um, in our schedule where everybody has second period and the kids are doing ice station. Ice station is individualized. So they take the ICIP and then they um, it individual, individualizes that. But then if you have your, your higher kids, like the tier one kids that, are, that, that need to make sure they keep growing, you can individualize a learning plan or give them something else during that period. We can also, we're thinking about also reshuffling the, the groups because everybody has a second period. We could just take those tier one kids that were that are our passers and put them together and meet and hit those TEKS and SEs more specifically. And then your tier two kids, same thing, short-term intervention, the, the second period and then um, they have to make sure they're in an enrichment class because some of these tier one kids may not have an enrichment class, but the tier twos make sure that they're put in an enrichment class and then attend the tutorials. And then for our tier three, everything that's stated up here plus Saturday tutorials or, or um, after school tutor tutorials because they are the ones that need the long term intervention. So, iStation, real quick, iStation, you're just in a computer and you're doing modules, assessments, yes, stuff like that. Now, so, yes. so that's, that's, in one, that's in one class. <laughs> then that's just in one class, but then we have a regular arts ed classes where there's a teacher right. doing the lecture. But in one of the particular classes, uh, when we're talking about intervention, iStation is just one of the tools. Right. But then, in the, in, like, that's only everybody in their second period. We stop what we're doing, second period, we're all doing iStation. That's one. But then they have another math class in third period, and then they have their RTI class back, you know what I'm saying? So it's, this is just one of the tools that we have that helps us track kids also, but they so, do have an a, a interventionist teacher that actually does lessons, a math teacher that helps them in their math class. 
Because one of the things that we noticed when I was working at the college, you know, we were using called the Plato Lab. Mm -hmm. it, 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 oh, it's, yeah. it, so uh, one of the things that we noticed that students were not, were not passing, they were t taking the Plato Lab, but they were not passing, but we were not providing instruction. So we removed the Plato Lab and we started providing actual instruction, our score started going up. So I, mean, I like that idea that they're having that ice station plus that, yeah. that So what the ice station gives us is a, it's a, a tracking tool. You know, oh. the, these are the kids that are being tiered according to the ice station, ice it, uh, thing, and then, but that's also what we use as the bathrooms for yeah. to, to do the actual uh, intervention in class. That's it. I'm done with that. The rest, of the, the other, these other templates are the same. It's just a different content. And then for our cycle two planning, everything continues the same. Um, we did the uh, 5.1, 5.3, and the 1.1. Those stay the same. Those are uh, district initiatives that we wanted to implement, and it's ongoing. But we also went ahead and, when Ms. Briones uh, met with us and did our mid-year review. Uh, the essential schools framework, um, I'm sorry, effective schools framework, um, that this was this part, but then we also went over our principal's evaluation support system, which we call the TPES, and we identified things that we as a campus, or me, myself as a principal, could grow, so we added that to our plan. It says by the end of the school year, 100% of the teachers will have a minimum of eight informal walkthroughs and one formal observation and complete the TPES observation cycle. So we're putting pressure on ourselves, um, and I'm not sure that we'll exceed that number, but that was the minimum, um, because I myself, the other day, me and Ms. Gomez, uh, we tried to calibrate our walkthroughs and walk together, and by the time we know it, we had already given teachers multiple walkthroughs. And so that number is the bare minimum, but it gives us a, a goal to, to try and achieve. So. So I'm gonna ask the same question I asked the other campuses. Okay, what have you identified? What methods have you identified that has been helping students grow? I think one of the things that, that I noticed is that the students that are, the fact that the teachers are working together with the parent enrichment teacher, that they can talk to each other and plan together. So it's not, it's not a, the enrichment class is not a standalone class. Get their piggybacking off of the regular class. So I think that that, is, that has really helped a lot. And actually adding that to the lesson plan, so that it's, it, they're held accountable for that, and there's, we know that there's communication between both teachers. So if you go into a classroom, an enrichment classroom, and you observe, you're gonna observe something that is either at a grade level below what the regular teacher is doing, or sometimes it's front-loaded, like they're preparing them for what they're gonna see in their regular think that that's healthy. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, thank you all for the phone. I appreciate that we get the opportunity to speak to you because we've been here all the year and this is the first time we've talked. No, no, thank you, thank you. You'll be here every, every meeting from now on. <laughs> <laughs> Hope they read the, the letter and that it is here. All right, I guess I take your Not I need to. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Not a sound. She's really tired, so. How do we use We have to. I want to put this on hold and go into close, and but you still need her to go. Did she leave something? Okay. We can continue. Mm -hmm. we can go just in hold this one yeah. for for and, and, and move to both. Read the rest or for it's just information. We'll so it'll be just this. this Mm -hmm. So we can, we'd have to go into close for now. No, we're, we're going to move high school to January. Then we want to go and accept the session because we have to take care of some hard people, the, the rest of this information. I don't know. It's, you want. it's okay, we can do high school okay. and then this week they get a session. Yeah, well, 
Okay. That's fine. That's fine. Almost no questions. <laughs> make it quick. We can make it quick. I, I, I'm sorry. Okay. So, um, Mr. Board of Trustees and our interim superintendent, Ms. Leonis. I just want to start with acknowledging our awesome staff that we have here, our campus administrative team, Mr. Delgado, our assistant principal, and Mr. Moreno, our instructional coach. Mr. Reyes was here earlier, but he had to leave uh, with an unexpected emergency that came up. So looking at our campus planning tool, our first strategy, our, fir our first focus priority that we uh, focused on was to provide feedback to teachers so that they could make adjustments to enhance student learning. And we also required them to add formative assessments, exemplar responses, and differentiated instruction into their assessments. So this was, this was an implementation strategy that we needed to implement. So okay, I want to go, for, want to go straight to post. The barriers that we encountered and then our next steps. So we know that we have to develop a more, and we actually have already done this, develop a more detailed instructional walkthrough calendar that does specify who we're going to visit, when we're going to visit them, and also, we've also identified in areas since differentiation is important to our campus, we wanted to make sure that we focus on that when we are conducting our walkthroughs and to give our teachers timely, clear, and actionable feedback. So we scheduled that into our calendar, into our schedule as well. Our close is that we do have our scheduled lesson plan audits that we have been conducting regularly and that we also are documenting our walkthroughs in DMAP so that we can then pull reports and look at the dimensions that we are really noticing or that perhaps we're not um, identifying, for, for example, like differentiation. So the second priority focus area for us was professional learning communities, PLCs. We wanted to make sure that they were data driven so that our teachers could then make adjustments to their instruction. Again, this was an urgent and important strategy for us. You can see um, the barriers that we encountered, which I want to um, discuss a little bit, because at the high school level, what's different than the other campuses is that we have a lot of singletons, meaning we have a lot of teachers that only teach that one area, one world geography teacher, one geometry teacher, and so forth. So because of that, the idea was they're going to have common assessments that they can evaluate and discuss their students' data, but of course, we, we couldn't do that. So that became a barrier for us. So what we had to do is pivot, and that's what we're going to do for the next um, cycle, is change the focus of our PLCs. And something that you know came about from our discussion with Ms. Riones was this aha moment that we had, because we realized we were already thinking, what can we do differently? We, could, we had already discussed, well, let's look at common standards, for example, all the CTE teachers can focus on college and career readiness goals, you know, those soft skills that we need to develop. But our English department, our math, and, and so forth, you know, they needed to focus more on their core areas. So in this conversation, that aha moment we had was, well, let's focus on what we do have in common. We might not have those content areas in common, but if you move on to the next slide, we have this in common. We developed a common vision for our campus. We said that at our high school, we envision a safe, positive, and supportive environment, empowering all students with a foundation to be college, career, and workforce ready. So with that in mind, we are going to develop data-driven improvement plans that focus on those areas. For example, we've already begun one on college and career readiness. Our students, seniors, took the TSI assessment, and we realized by looking at that data, that only 23% of our seniors are considered to be college ready in the area of English. So we've identified that as an element, a data element that we want to focus in on. So we're gonna be doing that with attendance and with discipline because we do have our vision statement that we have in common. The third priority focus area was ensuring that we had written clear goals and responsibilities so that those performance expectations would then help us drive 
those elements, those data elements forward, whether it's attendance, discipline, apology, readiness, reading, math. So we also knew that this was a high priority for us, and thankfully we were able to fully implement this on our campus. We experienced no barriers. And the next steps, again, is what I just mentioned, is to develop those improvement plans that will that will identify the performance expectations for the counselors, for the teachers, for the instructional coach, for the assistant principals, for everyone, so that we clearly know how we all come together as stakeholders to impact our student outcomes. The GLOWS is that we developed some universal practices already when we identified that we were having some issues on our campus. So we came together as a staff and we designed some universal practices, whether it had to do with uh, hallway, cell phones, how we monitor um, dress code, things like that. We also published a Google site where teachers can look up job descriptions and it identifies what the teacher expectations, roles, and responsibilities are, and for ourselves as well. And then we provided our teachers with training on the T-test rubric so that they knew from the state of Texas what the expectations are to move them from a more teacher-centered approach to a student-centered approach. All right, so um, our current instructional coaching plan, um, it kind of, of course, all, we're all, I guess, like all the other experts have said, we kind of all come together and we've really all grown together and I'm really grateful for those ladies. They really took me in, as you guys know, this is my first year as an instructional coach at the high school. So they're really helping me out. Um, so one thing that we're doing, of course, is, as Ms. Odovasa already said, is we're scheduling instructional rounds on our campus administrative team schedule. So now they're scheduled. It used to be, you know, you know, I would be in the English wing, Ms. Odovasa would be in another one, but now we're kind of all planned out and we know exactly where, where each of us are, you know, if we're, if Ms. Odovasa or Mr. Vendala or Mr. Reyes sees an issue with the teacher, they'll come to me and they say, can you help this teacher? you know, with classroom management, or they need to know a little bit more about their teams, you know, and I'm able to go in there, go into their classrooms, and now we can help. And so we're making sure that we're hitting all the teachers and not, you know, one, six weeks, we ended up all in, just by happenstance, we ended up all in the English wing, you know, now we're all spread out all over the place. Um, we did include on our schedule time for our feedback. Um, and one of the big things that I really like is discussing daily, um, whether it's with Mr. Wolf, like all, uh, all three of our administrators, on the growth areas for their specific teachers. Uh, you know, where teacher A or teacher B needs to grow on, we can work on it. So by the time they go back in for their formal or their informal, um, they're already, they're growing and they can see the change that, you know, in the classroom. Some of the current barriers that we see, um, of course, this was a little couple weeks ago, uh, we did a substitute shortage. Um, especially at the high school, we didn't have just a substitute shortage, we had a teacher shortage. Uh, we had, you know, we were short at the beginning of the year, five teachers, so I was in charge of planning for all those five teachers, and then whenever teachers were out, I was in charge of that as well. So that kind of took up a lot of my time at the beginning of the year. Luckily now, we have those substitutes that are, you know, graciously coming in, lifesavers, I call them all the time I see them, I'm like, you're a lifesaver. Uh, and they, because that's what they are, they're saving, you know, they're saving us. Um, so now I'm actually able to get into the, you know, start my day with the instructional coaching instead of spending three periods, you know, like three periods that I would have at the beginning of the day, you know, planning for five different subjects, five different contents, you know, doing all that. Um, and then of course I'm solving the technical pro uh, programs because again, at the high school we did an institute iStation, which was a brand new feature. We started Study Island, you know, we're starting all these new programs trying to close that COVID gap. Um, so of course with any new technical programs, we're, you know, come technical pro problems, so we're, you know, we fix those as well. One of the glows that we have, that I saw within our campus, is that regarding all these new instructional strategies, whether it was, you know, iStation, uh, Domain 1, these growth, growth templates, the, most of the teachers seem open and they were responding to the changes. They, they wanted to do the changes because we're all in it for the same business. We're all here for, for the kids. That's, that's what we're all here. And that comes up every single time we meet. We're not here for us. We're not here for the, you know, we're here for the kids. It's all for the kids to be successful. Um, one of the growths that I just see on my personal level is I want to find time to do those instructional rounds for those classes outside of the core subjects, and that's just me. 
you know, I tend to gravitate, me as a former science teacher, I gravitate towards science and I want to pull myself away. But, um, you know, that's my goal, just to kind of grow a little bit more and get those CTE that I'm maybe not as comfortable with. But, you know, I, I know I'll get there once, once I get my feet wet a little bit. So as you can see, this is our data for the benchmark. Um, we have English 1, and this green is scored of 49%. Uh, and on the, 20, on the benchmark that we took in November, we scored a 36. Uh, English 2, you can see the spring administration score along with the fall benchmark, which was a 53. Algebra 1 uh, was a 25 in the fall benchmark. Biology a 57, and the U.S. history was an 80. Uh, oh. <laughs> no, you're good, you're good, you're good. So, uh, go, go ahead one more. No, oh, go back. Right there. Uh, so these growth templates, those are the same growth templates that Ms. Jones uh, just showed you. So they're exact same things. That's what I use my data for. Uh, these numbers came exactly from there, and I don't want to have, you know, bore you and do it all over again. So uh, um, that she did it. So you can see that we were able to rank our tiers for Algebra 1, English 1, and English 2. So you can see that for our tier one student, we have that one student who's requiring a little bit of more intervention than you know, the other tier ones. So for those, we're gonna institute a short-term intervention that, that's more than likely gonna be uh, in their classroom. We're gonna restructure our WIN class, uh, accelerated instruction at the high school, we call it WIN, um, to focus on the individual needs of the student. So that good thing that we like this growth template is this growth template is just the student name, so I can go in and find out that this is Matthew, and Matthew needs help with um, exponential functions. So I can go in there and I'll help him with exponential functions. Um, so then we have nine students in tier two. They're gonna have short-term intervention. They're gonna get the restructure of their win. And then they're also gonna be provided after school tutorials. Because these are the ones that, you know, they're right there. Tier three, we have 90 students, which of course is what we expected coming back to COVID. We knew that we were gonna have a high tier three uh, those are going to require more long-term intervention within their tier one class. So actually, when they're in their English class, they're going to they're going to get a little bit more intervention. We're going to restructure them into win classes as well. We're going to include Saturday tutorials for those students, and of course, after school tutorials for them as well. And that template kind of follows the same way. So algebra one, English one, and English two. And we have already uh, I, we have already looked at it, and we know what these groups are all missing. So we know that. For example, English 1 is the grammar, that's what they're missing, grammar the writing. Algebra 1, um, we looked at it, it was the exponential function, you know, same thing. We really know what's missing, so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna attack those, and we're gonna make sure that they're ready for the start of test when the real one comes. Because of course, if they don't pass, they don't graduate. Right. Alright, so moving on to the next three months, December, January, February, the next cycle. So these are the three priority uh, focus areas for us. For 5.1, we're going to have teachers disaggregate multiple sources of student level data to inform and prioritize student specific instructional needs. And we discussed multiple sources can be quantitative or qualitative. And in the board packet that you received, uh, you do have um, the actual um, spreadsheet that shows you all of our action steps. So um, we're going to you know, have discussions and share the stories so that we get to know our students in depth and provide them with those instructional needs. So 5.3, teachers work collaboratively in PLCs to build capacity and to analyze student data to maximize performance. And that's going to go back to looking at college and career readiness, um, attendance, discipline, and instruction. Because at high school, we need to focus beyond the state assessment. We need to focus on being ready for college, being able to take a credit bearing course, and be able, you know, be able to pass that course without remediation. And then 1.1, the campus administrative team will develop detailed calendars and schedules with clear priorities and communicate expectations to others. So those are our three areas. And in closing, we are the mighty health units. One team, one mission, one goal. Questions, uh, I'm gonna ask the same question. What have you identified as far as what is working, what is not working uh, for student growth? Yeah, so one thing that we did notice was working at the high school really well is the teachers are actually, they were actually very uh, aware of the graduate release. It's something that's not new to the district, they've actually been using it a couple years. 
So something that they actually felt uh, comfortable with was that transition from the uh, from the, collab uh, from the guided to the collaborative, and collaborative and independent, and that's where we're seeing the students actually starting to grow. We can actually see them going from just what did the teacher learn to how am I going to apply it to the real world, and it kind of goes back to what Mr. Lawson just said that they have to be ready for life outside of high school. And so what, that's what we're seeing now, uh, you know, these students that are actively doing work, you know, they're learning it, the teacher's giving them the instruction, but now they're actually applying it. And that's something that we're able to see, and so we're able to see the growth of the students in there. You know, it's no longer just paper, pencil, got the test, did the test, got it wrong. Now it's, how do you, now it's like, now how are we gonna apply that in theorem to the real world? You know, how does that apply to, Instruction. How does that apply to law enforcement? You know, things like that. That's something that I feel we're seeing a lot of growth in the school. My second question is: You mentioned tutoring. How are you going to provide? What incentives are you going to provide for students to come into tutoring? I mean, how how are you going to engage them or say, you know, we got Saturday tutoring, Vengan What is what is the plan? Yeah, the, the plan we're, we're looking at. We're looking at uh, you know, kind of doing some like dress code practice, bringing them in for bombardment. Uh, Free time in the gym, you know, spare, spare days. You know, we're kind of just bringing it. We're trying to come up with a lot of ideas right now. Just try to do that right now. Like sometimes we're even like a lot of kids. They're they're happy with just food. So you know, making like snacks and stuff like that. You know, tacos, tacos, something golden. You know, all those things. You know, that's that's you know, those little things like that. That's what the kids want. And if we can do something like that, that's kind of what we're looking at. And if I can just add, um, we just had a budget workshop. All the principals we came together and looked at our budget to see, you know, do we have money for incentives? And that's something that coming back in January, Ms. Jones mentioned it, on January 3rd, we have the second phase of that workshop, and we're gonna actually start making those amendments. We need to, those, um, so we, we're already in that brainstorming process, but you're exactly right. That's the next question, is we, we have a plan, but how do we, how do we, Ensure that it's effective. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, we're we're going to uh, skip the rest of the agenda. We're going to go into a full session. We have uh, some hires to do. So I want to thank the principals, the uh, vice principals, and the instructional leaders for your presentations. Very good. In uh, information. I don't know if Ms. Leonis will dismiss you or tell you to wait until <laughs> her call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Time? 905. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Into it. 905. Hey, does anybody want to Maybe. I'm sorry. I can no, they can come back. Sir, how are you? I read, I read something. Yeah, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read. Uh, one of these people. Uh, and the German, sir? And the German, the German, or the reason? Oh, no, we're not a journey. No. We're not a journey. No, no, we're going into closed oh, session. Then we're gonna. But here it just says closed session. It doesn't say what, what uh, uh, education code. We'll see you all tomorrow. Good job. Yeah. And don't mind us anything that's not broken, okay? Okay, I was trying not to say. Uh, no, first of all, we meant it was so you study there. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Personal. Look, the guy puts another one that saves the high school all the time. Well, I guess. Say that again? The, the, the food service people just wanted a percent. The new guy oh, that's been here, but all. I didn't even know he was here. I mean, I. I you know, what were you saying, sir? Or not? No, I'm just saying that. That we're supposed to read a. Uh, uh, You're going uh, into closed session. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna read. I have it here. Okay. I'm waiting for them. Okay, say that it's for them to exit. I know. Okay, all right. And then we're gonna go and come back, and it's here on the top where we're gonna vote. Okay, all right. Maybe I got the wrong agenda. Uh, at this time, uh, the uh, the board of uh, trustees will meet in closed session, pursuant to the uh, Texas Open Meeting Act. And does the government call section 551.074 personal matters? Okay. You said 905, right? <laughs> <laughs>